Good morning, sir. Si. Ah, good morning, Bibudi. Good morning. Yeah. How are you? Yeah, good, good, good. It is just early morning, 5 o'clock. Okay. Our secretary, members, sir, our principal, Varadran, sir, Shastar, head of the Department of Civil Engineering, and other HODs and faculty members, sir, Bibudi. For this function. Okay. Okay, welcome. Sir, namaste. 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 Welcome and Namaskar. Thank you, thank you, Vidhi. Okay, happy that you are here. Probably you could not sleep comfortably because of this, because you have to rise early. Because of the time difference. Yes, yes, it's due to time difference. And I have to go for a field trip today. So that's the reason I keep on being. Okay, we will start. Hello? Yeah. Shah Sir? Sir, the recording start is on the phone. Who is on the start here? Good morning all. Let us begin the name of the Almighty, the most gracious, the most merciful with his blessings. I wish a very good morning to one and all. We all are passing through tough times and may the Almighty ease the testings and help us recover mentally, socially and economically. I welcome you all to the Hello. Ah, yes. Okay. Uh, I welcome you all to the five-day online faculty development program on techniques for disaster management and climate change adaptation strategies funded by APJ Abdul Kalam Technological University from 6th to 10th September 2021, organized by the Department of Civil Engineering, MESE Kuchipuram. Today, we are starting the session the inaugural function by Mr. Bibhuti Bhushan Karanayak, Senior Technical Advisor, Disaster Risk Management and Emergency, United Nations Development Program, Rwanda. Now I request everybody to do a silent prayer. Thank you all. Now I request Dr. Sayyid Jalaluddin Shah, Head of the Civil Engineering Department, MES College of Engineering, Kutipuram, for the welcome address. Good morning, one and all. Respected General Secretary of MES, Professor P.O.J. Lebba, Chief Guest of the Day, Mr. Bibhuti Bhushan Gadanayak, Principal Dr. A.S. Varidharajan, Professor V.K. Menon, 
uh, invited speakers, heads of departments, participants of the faculty development program, dear staff, faculty and friends. Faculty development programs, as we know, they are meant to enrich and update the knowledge of faculty members and to equip them to teach the state of the art uh, to, to the students. And one of the challenges that one has to uh, be prepared to face at all times is to survive any disaster. And that is possible only by having a thorough knowledge of the uh, different types of disasters commonly encountered and uh, in, by having planned techniques to overcome the foreseeable problems. This FDP is a step in this direction. And it is hoped that during these five days, the participants will gain enough familiarity with, with climate change scenarios, as well as techniques to manage and cope with disasters as civil engineers. On behalf of the Department of Civil Engineering, <laughs> MES College of Engineering, Kutipuram, I would like to welcome the General Secretary of MES, Professor P.O. Jalibha, Chief Guest of the Day, Mr. Bibhuti Bhushan Gadanayak, Principal Dr. A.S. Varajarajan, the Founder Member at National Disaster Management Authority, Professor V.K. Menon, Invited Speakers, Heads of Departments, Participants of the Faculty Development Program, Faculty, Staff, and Friends to this five-day uh, FDP, funded by the APG Abdul Karam Technological University on techniques for disaster management and climate change adaptation strategies from the 6th to 10th of December. I hope you all have a great enriching, uh, knowledge enriching experience in the coming five days. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Ms. Vidya Kanakaraj, FPB coordinator, to share a glimpse of the program. Okay, thank you, Shivan. A uh, very good morning to one and all. Respected General Secretary of MES, Professor P.O.J. Labba, Chief Guest of the Day, Mr. Biputi Bhushan Kadanayak, Senior Technical Advisor, Disaster Risk Management and Emergency, United Nations Development Program, Rwanda, Principal Dr. A.S. Varadarajan, Dr. Saeed Jalaluddin Shah, HOD Civil, Invited Speakers, Participants of the Faculty Development Program, heads of departments, my dear faculty and staff members, and friends. The Department of Civil Engineering, MES College of Engineering, Kutipuram, is organizing a five-day faculty development program funded by APJ Abdul Kalam Technological University on techniques for disaster management and climate change adaptation strategies from 6th to 10th September 2021. The faculty development program embraces the most concerned topics of today, disaster management and climate change. The techniques for disaster management is a systematic approach to identify, assess, and reduce the risk of disaster. It aims to reduce socioeconomic vulnerabilities to disaster, as well as dealing with the environmental and other hazards that triggers them. Climate change is one of the com most complex issues we are facing today as it contributes to the severity of disasters. One way of responding to climate change is adaptation. Hence, the participants are given exposure to understand, assess, predict, and respond to climate change. The main contents of the faculty development program include disaster risk reduction natural methods in structural engineering perspective, Civil engineers' role in disaster management and curbing climate change, climate change, extreme weather events and challenges in disaster risk reduction, urban heat island phenomenon, post-disaster need assessment and role of multi-stakeholders, transportation engineering in disaster mitigation, techniques for mitigating geotechnical engineering related problems during earthquakes, and ground assessment for landslides. Eminent personalities from IITs, NITs, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority, other recognized institutions and industry will be handling the sessions. I also would like to thank all the resource persons who have kindly consented to speak in the various sessions. I also take this opportunity to extend my deepest sense of appreciation to the management, the college authorities and members of the civil department for their support to make this faculty development program happen. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request uh, Professor P.O.J. Lebba, Secretary MESC, General Secretary MES, to give the presidential address. Thank you, 
Our very distinguished chief guest, Mr. Bibhuti Bhushan Gadnaik, Mr. Manan, and our principal, Dr. Varadarajan, HOD, Shah, and my dear participants. I'm extremely happy to be associated with this program because this is a very, the, this topic is very relevant and it has got current significance of disaster management. The, the, the subject has been introduced very, very well by our, our faculty member, that is the faculty development program, which embraces the most concerned topics of study. Now I'm so happy that these faculty development programs are giving real good uh, importance and also if good support to the faculty who need updation in their topic, in the topics of study. Nowadays, you know, in the syllabus and the, the new topics, new, new eminent, the emerging areas of technology, new, to gen, new generation programs have been introduced in the, the university. But this faculty, our faculty, maybe these old faculty are not updated about these latest changes. So the latest changes have to be brought to the attention, attention to the of the faculty, and they need updation in many topics. So that is why I said it's a very relevant. Uh, topic, especially disaster management. Of course, now disaster is something which happens without any without notice. So after, if at all any disaster, you are affected, it is affecting us. You should have be able to manage disaster and and also the post disaster technologies. Then climate change. Climate change is also we are facing climate change nowadays in a very serious manner. And I understand that uh, the overview of the topics which I have seen, I see the disaster risk reduction and methods in structural engineering perspective, then civil engineers role in disaster management and curbing climate change. So such important issues have been, have, have been included in the topics and also techniques for migrating geotechnical engineering related problems during earthquakes and also ground assessment for landslides. Such important topics, the you know, faculty should be updated with the information about these things. So the faculty development program really is an opportunity for our young, young faculty to know what is happening elsewhere and what is to be done if something happens in India. Nowadays, you know, because of the COVID situation, because we cannot conduct a, meet, a meeting offline, but in a way, it is good that Bibhuti uh, Bhushan uh, is present here only because of the online meeting. Otherwise, probably we would not have the, 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 pressure, the, pressure, the pressure of having Bibhuti with us. Anyway, he is from Rwanda, you know, Africa. Of course, I also had an opportunity to go to some of the places in Africa long back. But anyway, now this he is doing good work in, in the UNDP. And of course, his knowledge, experience, expertise, and his accumulated experience will be of use to us. And also, I notice that uh, very many eminent personalities are giving lectures in this session, I mean, in the five-day five program. That also will add glamour and also usefulness to the, uh, to the program. With these few words, I wish the program all success, and also I wish the participants will be definitely benefited by the five-day program. They will be enriched by knowledge on <coughs> management and climate change adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Now I request Dr. Varadarajan A.S., Principal MESE for the principal's address. No, sir, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Respected, respected chief guest. Everybody, please mute the other than principal. Others, please mute your. Okay. Respected Chief Guest, Sri Vibhuti Bhushan, Ritnayak, Senior Technical Advisor, DRM and Energy UNDP, 
Respected Secretary MESE, Professor POJ Lebba, Respected Head of the Department of Civil Engineering, Dr. Sayyad Jalaluddin Shah, Professor Benon, uh, the coordinator, Ms. Vidya Kanagaraj, Ms. Ambli, Assistant Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, Heads of the Departments, uh, Professors, and uh, most respected participants. A very good morning to all of you. I am immensely glad to be a part of this inaugural ceremony of the KTU-sponsored five-day online faculty development program on techniques for disaster management and climate change Actually, faculty development programs of this sort form potential sources of information on current trends and developments in the areas related to their themes. The technical FDP of this sort can be rated based on the parameters like the theme of the FDP, the relevance of the theme in the present day world, its academic, professional, and commercial relevance, the topics covered, and its multi or interdisciplinary conduct, the panel of resources persons, and the cross section of participants. I am sure that the FDP will come on the top with reference to all the above parameters. The very theme of the FDP, techniques for disaster management and climate change adaptation strategies addresses one of the most concerned topics of the day. Climatic changes is viewed uh, to be the root cause of many natural disasters. True that we cannot have a complete control on climatic changes, but one can think of strategies to predict, assess, understand, respond, and respond to the disasters that will that will actually uh, reduce the severity of such disasters apart from developing techniques for adopting disasters. The five-day FDP uh, program addresses all these aspects. The team has got tremendous academic, uh, professional, and the commercial relevance, and the mix of topics covered in the conference in this uh, uh, FDP are highly relevant in the present scenario in disaster management. The FDP also encompasses topics on transportation engineering, assessment of rock mass strength using classification um, system, urban heat island phenomenon energy management, etc., which represent different other related areas of uh, technology and underline the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary content of the FDP and offer a platform to professionals and the participants of different disciplines to come together and share their expertise for mutual benefit. The FDP has uh, got a very good participation and has got an array of renowned resource persons across the country who are well known in their fields for their contribution, which add tremendously to the worth of this FDP. I take up this opportunity to thank them all for, for spending their valuable time with us. I just to give a few words about the institution which is hosting this FDP. MES College of Engineering is a 25 year old institution belonging to a 150 member MES group of institution consisting of professional colleges, arts and science colleges, higher secondary schools and a medical college. The institution offers eight UG and the equal number of PG programs. It is an institution recognized by the AACT and all the programs have been accredited more than once by the National Bureau of Accreditation that has tremendously increased its credibility as a premier technical institution in the state. The institution is in the process of NAC accreditation at present. The institution has got an innovation center which integrates the research initiatives of uh, the institution under one roof, a new normal technology lab to develop products and processes to reduce the hardships faced by education, agriculture, and uh, upkeeping, personal and hands hygiene. It has got an educational technology center to evolve scientific methods in teaching learning process, a community service center to make available the expertise of the institution to the society through a cluster of 50 schools and 10 polytechnic colleges around the institution and a training academy that offers training programs 
to teachers in other institutions. The institution has inked an MOU with AIT Bangkok to facilitate overseas collaboration and the ICT Academy for research collaboration. The unmanned soldier assistant vehicle Ayuda developed using the facilities of MES Innovation Center by a, by a team of students of Triple E department won the championship in the All India Druze Expo conducted by DRDO in which 1,088 institutions including IITs and NITs participated. A solenoid wall controlled prosthetic leg developed by the team of students of Mechanical Engineer Department won the international acclamation. The Bandicoot Robo developed by Gen Robotics, a startup venture of a group of alumni of the alumni of the Department of Mechanical Engineering received global recognition. MSME has recognized the institution as an approved TBA, and the seven projects have been uh, submitted in the first phase for the award of grants. And uh, uh, I would like to conclude with a quote from Srimad Bhagavad Gita. <clears throat> Tasmat Yogaya Yujyaswa, Yoga sa karma su kaushala. This means karma yoga is actually the process of attaining perfection in one's profession or what one accomplishes. Contemporary domain knowledge is the most important ingredient for attaining perfection and this knowledge can be acquired by reading, listening, asking and sharing. And this FDP is sure to facilitate all these. To put it briefly, the five day FDP has got a very versatile team eminent personalities from premier institutions as resource persons, a very good cross-section of participants, an enthusiastic team of faculty from the Department of Civil Engineering as organizers, and the wholehearted support from the KTU. The participants and the resource persons who are our respected guests are Adidis, and they deserve our special respect. As the head of the institution, I accord a very special welcome to all of them, and I am sure that the FDP will fulfill the expectations of all the participants. From the bottom of my heart, I thank the KTU for funding this FDP. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next, we move on to the inauguration of the FDP. I would like to invite Mr. Bibhuti Bhushan Garnaik. Senior Technical Advisor, Disaster Risk Management and Emergency, United Nations Development Program, Rwanda, to give the inaugural address. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, all from Rwanda. Respected Dr. Saeed Jalaluddin Sa, Head of the Department, Civil, Engin Civil Engineering Department, MES College of Engineering. Respected Ms. Vidya Kanukarajan, Assistant Professor, MES College of Engineering. Respected Professor P. O. J. Leba, General Secretary, MES, uh, MES and Secretary, MES College of Engineering. Respected Dr. A. S. Bardarajan, Principal, MES College of Engineering. Respected Professor B. K. Menon, Founder Member, National Disaster Management Authority and my guide. Respected Mr. Satya Prakash Baranasi, Ms. Ambili S., Assistant Professor, MS Engineering College. Distinguished faculties for the five days online faculty development program on techniques for disaster management and climate change adaptation strategies. Ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the five days online faculty development program organized by Civil Engineering Department, MES College of Engineering, Kutipuram, Kerala. I thank the participants and experts for being here, such an impressive number. I'm sure you will agree with, with me that this faculty development pro program is timely and important, especially after the devastating flood experienced in Kerala in the year of 2018. The faculty de development is the process of providing professional development training and coaching to the faculty members to help them improve their work performance, particularly in specific areas such as teaching and research. The purpose of the faculty development program is building the strong foundation of an educational system to ensure quality of education. Yes. If this is the faculty development program, then we are in right track as disaster is everybody's business. 
the climate change is defined as the significant difference in the weather pattern over an extended period of time. Let me explain what the disaster management is. The disaster management is defined as strengthening preparedness, response, and recovery in order to reduce the impact of the disaster. Disaster hurts the most vulnerable. The global database says from 1998 uh, through 2018, 91% of storm-related uh, fatalities were in low and middle-income countries, even though these country, countries had experienced just 32% of storm. The World Bank Sopwebs report finds that almost 75% of losses are attributed to the extreme weather events and climate change threatens to push an million an additional 100 million people into the extreme poverty by 2030. The World Bank's unbreakable reports finds that natural disasters have had large and long-lasting impacts on the poverty. Population growth and rapid urbanization are driving the increase of disaster risk. The United, United Nations estimates that more than two-thirds of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. The World Bank's aftershocks report explains that these trends from river and coastal flood, floods alone. Over the past 50 years, natural disasters in Asia Pacific countries have affected 6.9 million people and killed more than 2 million people. 122 million people are affected by affected every year in Asia Pacific countries, and the annual losses uh, of life is around 6,200 people in 2019 and 20. The Asia Pacific Disaster Report also speaks in 2021 estimates that annual economic losses arising from the cascading climate change risk would almost double to 1.344 billion US dollars, equivalent to 4.2% of the regional GDP under the post climate change scenario. Coming down to India, India is very much vulnerable to multiple disasters. The country hosts around 70.4% of the world population. The disaster prevention uh, wave says from 1980 to 2020, India has experienced a number of disaster events. The government of India is uh, has put a serious effort in strengthening institutions by way of creating National Disaster Management Authority, enacting the Disaster Management Act, and creating protocol state government to follow towards disaster management. Development and disaster resilience have become interwoven. As a result, development are getting disaster resilient, and development are being done in such a way that they are in disasters by themselves. I expect this five-day online faculty develop, uh, development program on techniques for disaster management and, and climate change adaptation strategies will be helpful for the faculties to understand the techniques for disaster management and climate change adaptation strategies and to mainstream in their respective subject. As disaster is everybody's business. They say it is better to prepare and prevent than repair and repair. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to invite Ms. Ambuli S, Department Coordinator, Civil Engineering Department, MESE, to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Shibin. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Shibin? Okay. I feel very proud as our department is organizing a five days online FDP on techniques for disaster management and climate change adaptation strategies, sponsored by KTU. The program covers the technical talks by eminent personalities and academicians from various institutions and industries in India. I am entering to my duty. First of all, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our beloved head of the department, Dr. Saif Jalaluddin Shah, for his constant support and guidance for organizing this program. Now I would like to thank our secretary, Professor Tio Jaleba, General Secretary, MES, for giving us motivation in organizing the events and delivering the presidential address. Next, I would like to thank our principal, Dr. A.S. Varadrajan, for support, supporting us and giving us giving the address. 
Now, I would like to express my sincere thanks to our chief guest and today's speaker, Mr. Vibhuti Bhushan Gadnaik, Senior Technical Advisor, DRM and Emergency for inaugurating the program and being a part by delivering a technical talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining with us and sparing your valuable time and sharing your valuable comments in your busy schedule. I also thank Dr. K.P. Mohammed, former director, MEC, and Mr. P.K. Menon for joining with us. Next, I would like to thank the coordinators of this program and all staff members of C department. Finally, I would like to express my gratitude to all participants for joining with us to make the five days program a grand success. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning and welcome all to the faculty development program. The three sessions for today include post disaster need assessment and role of multi stakeholders, architecture strategies to mitigate climate change and disaster management in Kerala and overview. So for the smooth conduct of the program, I would like to, I would like everyone to abide by the following guidelines. Attendees are requested to mute their mic. Please do not present your screen in between. Questions are to be posted in the chat box. The organizing team will present the questions to the speaker at the end of the session. The speaker will answer all questions if the time permits. If you need any assistance during the program, please use the chat box. Kindly fill up the feedback forms after each session. The link of the feedback forms will be shared in the chat box. Live streaming for the program will be available on YouTube. So now it's time to move, move to the first session of the faculty development program. Ms. Vidya Kanagaraj will introduce the speaker. Please, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Harita. I'm really happy to have Mr. Bibhuti Bhushan Kadanayak as our first speaker of the FDP and the speaker of the session. He is working as Senior Technical Advisor, Disaster Risk Management and Emergency, United Nations Development Program, Ministry in Charge of Emergency Management, Government of Rwanda. Rwanda. Received, he has received the Master's Degree on Disaster Preparedness, Mitigation and Management from Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, Master's Degree in Social Work from Utkal University and studied MPhil from Central Institute of Psychiatry, India. After graduating from AIT, Mr. Gadanai joined with the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction, Bangkok, to work on the institutional and policy landscapes of disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in South Asia. As a part of his responsibility, he was engaged for the coordination of intergovernmental agencies like SARC, Asian, for the provision of assistance to interagency working groups and committees. He has analyzed the climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction institutional and policy landscape of India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia. In the recent past, he has drafted the National Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction for Rwanda, Comprehensive School Safety Security Policy Guideline for Aza, West Bengal in India, Turks and Caicos Islands. He has also worked with UNICEF and United Nations Development Program. During his tenure in different countries, he was deputed to universities on special request as a guest faculty to teach subjects of disaster management and climate change adaptation. In addition to his professional achievements, he has contributed in journals and has also authored a book titled A Path to Disaster Resilient Communities, published by Lambert academic publishing Germany. So, sir, now you may start the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, yes, Thank 
just a minute. There is some. Yes, yeah, sir. Share your screen. Yeah, how to share the screen yesterday? I did it. I don't know what is going to happen. Mm. Are you able to see the scenes? Screen. Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Screen. It was visible. Okay. Yes, sir, your mail is visible. Let's stop. Yeah. Are you able to see the slides? Yes, yeah, sir. It's visible. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for your invitation, inviting me for this session. Uh, it was really a great opportunity to be part of your team. I appreciate uh, Dr. Sashidharan for you know, you know, helping me and uh, involving me in various activities for, with regard to this kind of taking session and interacting with you. Let me a little brief about the Rwanda. Rwanda is a, a, a country uh, is a country on the uh, on the top of millions of the mountains. You will you'll find a lot of mountains in order to go from one place to another. I have to go down from one mountain and ride on another mountain. Just if at all I want to have a, you know, to bring little something from outside that it's a, I have to go to distance. And the weather condition is very much neutral and this country is very vulnerable to multi-hazards like floods, landslides, earthquakes, this uh, volcanoes, all these things. I think my volcanic experience, this is the first country where I got you know, to work in the areas of volcanic eruption. In the recent past, we had a kind of a severe volcanic eruption at the bordering area of uh, Rwanda and Democratic Republic Congo. Rwanda as compared to Democratic Rep Republic Congo, Rwanda is very much organized and is comparatively developed. And infrastructure and other things are uh, very much developed. So that way I got an opportunity to work in that area and to, to get involved uh, representing all UN agencies to under this post disaster need assessment. And, uh, uh, see the situation, interact with multi-stakeholders, departments, and the ministers, so that, and UN agencies, so that we could have to present this uh, situation, and analyze and develop the report and submit to the government so that we can mobilize resources to address the immediate need that is happening in the country. Let me, before I get into the topic, let me speak about little what are the things I'll be discussing during the presentation. I'll be speaking about uh, since um, we are having this uh, uh, session with, uh, in the Kerala. So I wanted to speak a little about the uh, Kerala situations and what is happening in India, so that it will be easy for me to link with uh, uh, the post-disaster grid assessment what we can in, in, the, in uh, Rwanda and in Rwanda to address the volcanic eruption. During my sessions, I'll be talking about India's deadliest disasters he has just experienced last century in India, Kerala, India in brief, hazard profile of Kerala and India, Kerala fraud in 2018, what exactly the PDMA and its objective, why to conduct post disaster need assessment, the key, key principles, volcano eruptions, Goma, um, Democratic Republic, Congo, and Rwanda, PDMA activation, typical sectors and subsectors, role of national government and uh, government in assessment role of UN agencies in the assessment, post-disaster need assessment implementation process, factors contribute to the success of post-disaster need assessment, the Rwanda experience, way from Rwanda, scenario subsequent scenario and subsequent earthquakes that is being experienced. What is most likely to happen in case of very volcanic eruption, involvement of multi-stakeholders, methodology, findings and recommendations, scopes and opportunities. So these are the certain things I'll, during my discussions I'll be uh, discussing with uh, all the participants. So let me speak about the India's dead year disasters. In uh, 1618, uh, we have experienced a severe earthquake in Mumbai, where we lost 2,000 uh, lives. Similarly, in Bengal, we lost all, around 300,000 uh, deaths. In Cyclone 1864, we had 60,000 deaths. 
similar way in the great famine in 1876 to 1870 uh, 78 we had uh, around 50 point, uh, 58.5 million people were affected and 5 million deaths uh, due to starvation that happened so similarly there are severe different hazards and uh, different disasters that was well experienced in india where we have lost uh, you know, so many lives in, 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 in the, during the drought in 1987 we lost around 3 million uh, we we it was affected around 300 million people as it were disaster experienced in the last uh, century if you see the earthquake in 1905 around the, the, the death was around 200 uh, around 20,000. In Cyclone 1977, Andhra Pradesh, we had the right, there were around uh, 10,000 death, deaths. And uh, uh, Latur, Latur earthquake, it was 1993, we lost around 7,928 uh, people uh, died, around 30,000 30, were injured. Similar way, in the recent past, we experienced uh, multiple disasters in the country, which has affected uh, many parts of the country. In the 2004 tsunami, we lost around 10,749 deaths. Similar way, it has affected mostly the few fees of folks, around 200,000 uh, fees of folks, uh, lively uh, folks were affected. The Maharashtra flood in 2005, it has also caused around 1,094 deaths and uh, 54 missing. In the Kashmir earthquake, we, which we all of were experienced and we have watched in the TV. Similar way, various disasters that has affected the country in various ways, uh, like you know, remembering the uh, Tamil Nadu cyclone Misa and uh, um, uh, uh, remaining uh, other uh, disasters. Let me little brief about the Kerala. Uh, Kerala is the total area of the land is around 38,863 square kilometer as compared to India. India has got 32.87. Uh, square kilometers land area and it, uh, there are 44 rivers flowing in Kerala as compared to this in India it is around 400 rivers with a catchment area of 252.8 million hectares to discover. The fair forest area is similar way like around 11,266 square kilometer area of forest land as compared to India is also the same. The coastline is a bit, uh, uh, making little difference the Kerala has got 590 90 kilometer of coastline area, whereas altogether India is doing around 7,570 you know, kilometer of the coastline area. Similarly, as compared to others, the population density is Kerala is higher as compared to the total India um, density of population population and uh, the population also growth also is going in a similar way and altogether india has got 718 districts whereas kerala has 14 districts and uh, comparatively india uh, the, there are uh, 1664 villages in kerala whereas altogether there are 664000 uh, villages are there around 0.6.6 uh, million villages are there altogether in india the hazard profile of Kerala and India. Kerala is vulnerable to lightning, basically the lightning occurs during April, May, October and November. And uh, the state is vulnerable to flood and landslide. landslide. Particularly 14.5% of the state land area is very much vulnerable to flood. And it is known that around 65 uh, fatal landslides occurred in 1961 and 2009 causing deaths of 257 individuals. The, between 1871 and 2000, the state had experienced around 12 moderate uh, drought years in Kerala. Uh, around 570 kilometers, I have already discussed about uh, these things, and the, the Kerala is experiencing around 39 uh, phenomenon with potential to cause the disasters. Or though all the disasters are not, uh, no, it's called, no, 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 it is not affecting the country, but some of them are they are going beyond the capacity of the country you know, to you know, manage the disaster situation. India, uh, if you, as compared to Kerala, India around 40, around 12 percent of the land area is you now affected by flood. Around 68 percent cultivable area is vulnerable to flood. 8 percent of the total area is vulnerable to flood, uh, cyclone. 60% uh, of the land mass is vulnerable to uh, uh, earthquake 
tsunamis around, as I said earlier, 17 square kilometer is vulnerable to and exposed to the you know, kind of flood. I just wanted to you know, share the uh, so video on which you know, this, uh, about what happened in the flood in As compared to Kerala, if you see the videos of uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the country, what happened over here in Rwanda with the volcanic eruption, 
it was more devastating. Even the videos of Kerala, what we received during this you know, flood situation and landslide there in Kerala, it was also very much devastating. And what we have seen it in lots of this video, what we got, it is more devastating. So that's the reason I thought of you no know, taking a video which has already published in YouTube so that it will be long more you know, organized to see share with you and to have let me discuss about, you know, in a, soon after the 2018 uh, uh, flood and landslide in Kerala, there was a post-disaster uh, post lead assessment was conducted in Kerala with the joint labor with the UN, the UN agency as well as the government of Kerala, and it was also published globally. Uh, so I do not want to speak much about the PDN and what we conducted in Kerala, but I will be speaking transferring you to the current experience that we did and the post disaster lead assessment in Rwanda. It was uh, basically this, you know, this uh, volcanic eruption, it occurred around the, the, the bordering area of the Democratic Republic uh, Congo and uh, Rwanda. It was just at the border. I had been to that place and I have seen the situation. It was really very much devastating. Let me speak about what the post disaster lead assessment is. Post disaster lead assessment is an internationally accepted methodology for determining the physical damages, economic losses, and cost of meeting recovery needs after the natural disaster through a government-led process. Basically, this is a government-led process which would be headed by the government and the other agencies can provide the support, like specifically from the UN, World Bank, or the interagency coordination group, like in Kerala. Here we have a kind of new group. Uh, network of international non-government organizations. So that way, it is a kind of a mutual support which is being uh, support is provided to the government and government is at the forefront of the need. The specific uh, objective of PDNA, a PDNA is a mechanism for joint assessment recovery planning after the disaster. In a, a case of disaster, what are the kind of damages such as the community? all together by involving the community, by involving the government, by involving the elected representatives, which is a kind of a person that has carried out. The second objective is, is kind of a joint assessment and analysis of the damage, and dam and damage economic losses, affects, the, uh, affects and impact of the disasters, and identifies the recovery rates across, across identified sectors. Specifically, what are the various sectors? Health, education, nutrition, protection, wash, all those agriculture, or what are the damages basically this uh, no, disaster has <coughs> giving? So that's why it's a kind of assessment and analysis of what damages it has caused. And the assessment also highlights the macroeconomic and human It also assesses what are the, it goes to the macro level and it makes what are the disasters, what are the impacts, of, you know, what are the impacts of the by these uh, disasters. And the recovery needs identified helps to mobilize resources and develop a comprehensive recovery of the strategies. The, what are the recovery needs has been identified? It also helps to add to, to have an uh, uh, on table discussion with or a round table discussion with the funding agencies so that we can support and address the ongoing uh, disasters, which can be well addressed to meet the need of the people at the community level. What is, why we exactly we want to uh, conduct the post disaster need uh, assessment? Post disaster is a country owned uh, led process. This post disaster uh, need assessment is a country owned. It, it, it is supposed to be owned by the country, and the country should be at the forefront of the leading distance. Other agencies like our support for being in UN agencies or being uh, from the World Bank or from the uh, interagency coordination group, we can provide the technical support and the people help you to organize this and we can conduct the so this is what basically it is a country led process. By bringing together uh, key stakeholders engaged in the recovery, the PDMA, PDNA aims to avoid duplication and harmonize assessment efforts so that the multi agency will not go for the assessment. It will be a one go and one approach so that the agencies, those who are having support, they can provide accordingly. 
like we conducted this uh, disaster, this post disaster grid assessment. Then it was tabled before the UN city as well as the development partners meeting. And accordingly, the agencies, those who are meeting their mandates, accordingly, they provide the support. So it was a kind of a you know, joint process so that there will be no kind of you know, duplication of the things. So all together, they can join together in order to assess the entire process. It is a multi-stakeholder approach, as I said from the beginning, it is a multi-stakeholder approach so that each sector issues are well addressed. For example, health, education, nutrition, protection, was agriculture. So every sector member will be you know, assembled uh, together to identify the damage caused in their respective um, areas. And this also approach will ultimately help in mobilizing the resources. The key principles of PDNA is a kind of a, a common platform for coordinated, coordinated action so that it is a common platform. Everybody has been brought together so that the action can be made in a coordinated uh, approach. It enhances the country resilience uh, to the crisis. It also helps to bring them back in a better way so that it will help to you know, establish the resilience in the country. It harmonizes the methodologies, toolkits, and capacity building approach Whatever the institution are diff diff bringing different tools or technologies, it can harmonize the technology. As I said from the beginning, it is a government-led process, and it also helps in strengthening national institution like we seek the support of National Disaster Management Authority. Also, we see how the law and policies are in place, so and how the strategies also can be made. So it also helps to uh, the, the strengthen the different national institutions. It also helps to to stand the national platform for the error, what we have made with involving multi agencies. It is also a people centered, inclusive approach to the civil society. This approach is being, uh, it is a people centered approach because we link the process, we try to listen from the host mouth. In the sense, we go to the community, we interact with them, and we identify the uh, damages and we also identify the need, their need. Accordingly, we incorporate the impact in the plan. Let me speak about how these things uh, happen. I think uh, on Saturday, 22nd May 2021, around 1830, 18 UPC, the first news around the, 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 the first news of an eruption of volcanic volcanic uh, Bengal occurred at the north city of Goma in the north Kivu province. There is a Kivu, Kivu province at the in the Democratic Republic Congo. On 22nd of May, we got this message. And uh, soon after the getting the message, the, 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 the volcanic eruption started continuing. See, all these videos was taken by a mobile camera when it occurred. You see how this you know, fire is you know, attacking to the, 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 the houses and it has really you know, created a devastated kind of situation. Total of number of people affected in this uh, volcanic eruption around is 2 million and number of more than 100,000 uh, they became homeless and refugees across the, uh, the refugees those who were from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, they moved to uh, Rwanda and more than 5,000 people, they uh, immediately, it was all in the evening, they moved to, the, to Rwanda, they crossed the border and the border was opened by that time because I was there uh, during that situation in the nearby district. And uh, most of the roads were disconnected. This uh, the road disconnected has gone more than uh, one. It has affected around some 20 roads in that area. Human life uh, has lost has gone 250. Number of children separated from their, their house was around 150. Number number of children uh, are feared to be missing around 170. 
number of people displaced um, in the sake around 25 kilometers in northwest of Goma and 25,000. So soon after the earthquake, uh, soon, soon after this you know, volcanic eruption, there was an earthquake and we experienced around uh, uh, more than uh, 2,000 uh, you know, recurrent uh, tremors in the country, which was really going from. Uh, so this is the video where how the people are you know, moving from the side where the volcanic corruption is saying it is the uh, Democratic Republic Congo, and uh, this side goes where people come from. So, this is the way the volcanic corruption is going, and it is going So let me see about the PDNA activation process. The PDSA, it was a, the PDSA, PDNA was, we had various discussions, various meetings at the apex level. We had a meeting at the ministry level, at the ministry in charge of emergency management. Honorable minister was heading the entire team. Then we had also at the meeting, had a meeting at the UN level where all the UN agencies, they joined together, we had a discussion. And on this uh, on this day specifically, I was in a different place, which is around 150 kilometers out from the, uh, the, the city, the capital headquarters, from the Kigali. So I was called overnight and uh, involved in the entire process. And the next day morning, I had to move to the mission to the bordering area of the Democratic Republic Congo and Rwanda. Uh, the, the, the PDNA act activation, it was an in-country communication between European Union, World Bank, UN, uh, of a possible request for a PDNA. It was the government who we were requested mm -hmm. for this. And official request from the government, it came to conduct the PDNA. And immediately we contacted our uh, you know, the colleagues from World Bank, those who were involved in this kind of process. We invited our colleague from Ethiopia, so they joined with us. And we had a kind of, you know, the, the intelligence coordination group, it was like you know, Ningo, network of international non-government organizations. So the, we all coordinated together and uh, we joined in this. Deployment of a planning mission formulated, uh, the, we developed a kind of a term, terms of reference, how the things will go. And definition of support of the government partners, uh, uh, they were provided uh, all in the process. So it was it was in a very you know we were you know involved in a very you know war food basis in order to uh, conduct this post disaster need assessment so that the support can be provided to people in order to do these things. Before that, the World Food Program UNHCR they also uh, provided the support at the same time. The ministry in charge of emergency management in Rwanda was leading the process and they provided the support and facilitated the relief rehabilitation materials to the people because many people they were accommodated you know, the, in, the, in the refugee camp. It was a, the camps are meant for the limited people and all of a sudden thousands of people they joined together from the Democratic Republic from the Rwanda. So that created a kind of human institution over there. Typical sectors and subsectors, those who are involved in the process, basically the sectors were productive, social, and infrastructure. The subsector sectors were like agriculture, commerce, industry, tourism, under social housing, education, health, culture, under infrastructure, water and sanitation, community infrastructure, energy, transport, telecommunication. communication. All these kind of you know, different departments, uh, the, they joined with um, in the in the these things, the good thing is that over here in Rwanda we have already identified two focal points in each of the ministry and each of the departments. Those who will be ultimately joining with us in case of there is an emergency, and this national platform for disaster risk reduction is also very much you know, active in these areas. In the entire process, we took also the cross cutting areas like gender, governance, environment, disaster risk reduction. Uh, em employment, uh, uh, employment and livelihoods. So those areas also considered while we went for the post disaster made assessment. Basically, the role of government uh, in the assessment process, I think leadership and coordination was well played by the uh, ministry and data collection and access to the information, pre disaster data, national database, like ministry's database, post disaster data, like uh, we collected all the data from different uh, ministries and uh, departments with regard to these things. And uh, the providing uh, logistic support, the minima, in order to conduct the, the um, 
PDMA, the space was uh, the secretariat uh, space was provided by the Minima, the Ministry in charge of the management, and they also provided a facilitated a workshop place. We had a hotel and we conducted this kind of you know workshop over there. How the process can be conducted? What are the things we have to you know identify? What are the how we all can go together in helping multi industry? So those kind of things, you know, multi institutions, how we can go together. Review and address of the PDNA report. Review the process. It involves review all the sector reports uh, for accuracy. Approves the report at the highest office level. Allocates the resources. Present report for the international assistance. In fact, all this process we are done. We, we did it in the locally. Role of UN agencies in assessment. Sectoral uh, social sectors basically housing land was uh, headed by UN Habitat, education by UNICEF, health by WHO, culture by UNESCO. The productive sectors were, were like FAO and ILO were involved. Infrastructure like uh, UNICEF, water and sanitation by UNICEF, and uh, the community infrastructure by UNDP. The cross cutting issues like DRR, governance, gender were, at, uh, the, were being uh, now adopted by UNDP, uh, UN Women, and UNEP. The PDNA implementation process, like establish, establishing a PDNA assessment team, we formulated a team involving multi, you know, uh, involving uh, professionals from the multi agencies and ministries. Then conducted a training and orientation orientation of the PDNA, how we can go together in order to have a you know, kind of a common understanding. We conducted a kind of a uh, half day training program involving these things uh, because it was really uh, very much rough, and all of us we were working uh, on workbook basis. The honorable minister was also with us in the field, and some of the permanent secretaries, like our principal secretaries in India. It's called otherwise permanent secretaries over here. They were also there uh, on the ground in order to support us. Then data collects uh, because while we are orienting all the multi sectors, so they were also present. They were also part of the team. The data collects and the validation of draft sectoral reports. Whatever data we collected over there internally, they are only we stayed there around seven days, so it was validated over there. Consolidated and analysis of sector effects, impacts, and needs. So we consolidated all the uh, data and we analyzed the sector effects and what are the impacts has given and what are the needs is uh, required for the people. That was also done over there. Formulating the recovery strategy. We also formulated the recovery strategy over there because we had a big team over there. And we also um, developed the resource mobilization and implementation mechanism over there in the PDNA implementation process. It was really a very, very huge process and involvement of all the officials, starting from the honorable ministers, starting from the, the permanent secretaries, and the, the, the professionals, because all were involved in the entire process. It was a really very different you know, approach altogether. The, let me discuss about the factors that contribute to the success of a post-disaster need assessment. Uh, in fact, these terminologies will be little new for the academicians, and uh, because it is a new area and uh, uh, new ways of in interventions, it is a very practical uh, you know, approach. Once you are practically involved, things will be very you know easy to understand. In the entire process, all were involved: the universities, the ministries, the health, all the departments, they were involved. And really, we found to be, you know, while I was involved with some of the groups, I found the academicians were more supportive as, you know, compared to, as compared to the professionals, because analyzing the data and identifying the need was well played by them. And where we were having some uh, professors from uh, engineering colleges in Rwanda, some professors from the universities, specifically the geography departments, the, the social work departments, then the environment department. It was really a quite uh, helpful in the entire process. So what are the basic you know, factors which can bring the success? It should be led by the government. It, uh, the government should be led at the things if the leadership is well, then things can be done in their better way. National expertise, we can bring all the, as I said, we have identified focal points in each department, those who are well trained with disasters. So that was also very much helpful to us. 
linked with recovery uh, recovery so the what about the damage uh, has occurred how it can be linked with you know, the recovery planning so that was also you know, one of the these things uh, was a you know, big achievement and these are this contributes to our success factor the right balance like pda must have right balance between social and economic infrastructure needs because sometimes we get biased and sometimes specifically while we were uh, you know, doing this work we are more we were more into infrastructure than into considering the social sectors this was one of the drawbacks we identified while working with uh, together all the you know, ministries and departments and you know, other institutions so sometimes we are very much inclined towards uh, infrastructure giving more attention to infrastructure Structure considering less about the social and economic aspect of the damage which has caused in that area. Though it was a time bound, definitely the PDMA idea was a time bound. We spent around 15 days in order to come out with the final report and presenting before the minister and uh, UNCT and uh, the development partners. And it was a collaborative effort that uh, what I have said from the beginning, it is a you know, kind of a collaboration with multi agencies where UN agencies and World Bank and uh, IAGs, the ministries, various departments, academia, everybody, they were involved in the entire process. So our all this involvement brought the all this involvement of various stakeholders brought the success of the entire achievement. Let me speak about little the experience in Rwanda because I have already said so. I am just little bringing about uh, about the, you know, the the kind of damages and what we experienced while we were doing these activities in Rwanda. This Rwanda is located between two branches of East African uh, Rift system, and there are both dormant and active volcanoes in both the areas. Nargange and uh, Nyamuragira are the active, you know, these are the two different uh, districts and uh, the different locations. Uh, and, uh, uh, Nargango itself is around 900 meter wide crater. It has got a kind of a crater which is you know, stretching around 900 meter. And it, it opened the vents of the vents where lavas erupt from. To the, we had also experience in 2002, there was a volcanic eruption. And second, we had this one in 2021. There are active fault, uh, active faults through which earthquake has uh, produced because there are active volcanoes and they are also still around this area, which also continues the uh, recurrent distance. Officially recorded around 125 various uh, earthquakes we experienced soon after this volcano, but the media says we experienced around 2000. Even in my house where I was sitting, because it is all fixed around the glasses, the, the place where I stay, the, the, the glass will start dancing, you know, it will create a kind of a noise by the early morning and we getting ready to go to the office, getting ready to go to the office. We have experienced several number of, you know, kind of, a, um, 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 Volcanic uh, the earthquakes in this country. The highest has gone 4.8, the magnitude of uh, volcano, and the, the lowest was 3.5. 3 uh, highest has gone 5.1 uh, magnitude uh, in uh, mag magnitude of earthquake, and the lowest was 3.5. In fact, I personally I used to keep my door unlocked, my front door I keep unlocked. So that in case anything goes wrong, I'll just open the door and I'll run away from the house. Because this, all the doors and windows of these houses are you know, made up of the irons. So it is difficult in case of emergency to open the door and go to run out of the house. So I always keep it not open. I just do not lock it. I keep it like that so that in case of emergency, I can run out. Because in this house, you know, this country is like the situation is like this. You do not have a fan in the house, neither you can have an air condition in the house because the temperature is the weather, the temperature is neutral. So that way, you cannot experience, you know, in case there is anything goes on, in case of there is earthquake, unless until your bed moves or something. So that way, I just you know as a preventive measure, I keep it like that. But normally it is not advisable so that you keep uh, these things because of the security reason and other things. So let me little brief about what are the subsequent earthquake, how it started. We had uh, no kind of a eruption on 22nd May. Lava started flowing around, it covered around five hectare areas uh, in that uh, between uh, between uh, Democratic Republic Cong Congo and Rwanda. Then followed by a series of earthquakes that I have already shared with you. We had the earthquake maximum of magnitude 5.1 uh, with minimum 
uh, scale and uh, followed by series of earthquake existing fissures and uh, was reactivated in uh, northwest and southeast region of rwanda eastern map of the main fissure was observed in rojero uh, district i think it is it is at the, the bordering area of the uh, rwanda most likely the earthquake it may because here in uh, rwanda we have got a big lake it's called lake uh, chivu and there the government also you know that lake is sometimes poisonous some of the areas are not ad advisable to venture in because of the methane gas and all the world it comes out in that lake so it may cause damage normally people do not venture into the lake and other than traveling by boat they do not take you know get into normal you know, getting normally they do not get into water or you no know, kind of swimming and other things are promoted because of the you know the the the, the methane gas uh, issues in that uh, lake so the earthquake from the eruption is less likely but because of the eruption maybe we may not experience uh, you know a kind of a severe earthquake but the magnitude has gone what we have recorded is around 5.1 and the volcanic eruption the eruption will depend on the refilling of the uh, the magma chamber and the uh, drained uh, nerikangol uh, lava lake so that in fact it is you know kind of a there is no do not have such kind of a human system of you know, volcanic eruption okay the then lake liview gas outburst it may so happen in case the the biggest magnitude because the the place where the volcanic eruption took place it is around 2 km away from that volcan from that lake so in case anything goes wrong it may be you know the lake may outburst and something it may it will create you know q and q situation it is a very huge lake it is more than uh, like our chilka lake in case anybody might have visited to odisha involvement of multi stakeholders let me share what who are the uh, no, multi stakeholders involved in the entire process the government agencies like the pdn was organized under the leadership of uh, minima the local mayor like the elected representative as i said they were also present in the entire process the agencies participated like the local gisimi hospitals the various these are the minakofin minalog minaidu these all are different ministries along with the rwanda university rwanda engineering college all were involved around some 18 different uh, now agencies they were those were involved and from the development partners perspective even i was on behalf of even i was leading the entire process and i had a, we had a colleague from world bank also we had a colleague you now from uh, network of international ngos this in the picture the lady who is standing is sees the you know president of the network of international uh, ngos so that way we all were involved in the entire process methodology as i said from the beginning we had an orientation to the uh, participant sectoral team formation as we identified various sectors and the right hand side we have identified and the thematic areas so that way we identified the various sectors and involved this things uh, uh, um, um, various uh, professionals in the team field visit to the affected location with visani town because the town the bordering town name is called visani so that way we people were visiting in that area sharing of uh, modified uh, post disaster net format because we localized based on our need we localized that format what is the global format is existing we localized according to the need intensive desk review and previous uh, similar incidents uh, data datas were collected we jointly together uh, together we formulated a small task force who was doing all these activities we invited each of the teams to present and discuss then we ultimately validated there before we leave the uh, area where we went for the kind of a post disaster net assessment before we come to the capital we have uh, to the kigali city we have to submit to the before honorable minister and other stakeholders so that we validated over there the team was divided in six thematic areas like risk, risk monitoring and evacuation housing infrastructure and utilities road bridge and electricity education health and trade and coordination these are the some of the areas we were identified 
major findings were like building infrastructure destroyed and uh, roads were damaged school buildings were damaged part of the, the hospital was severely damaged and the lifeline of the the hospital like the oxygen system the central was thoroughly damaged so it is unless until uh, somebody sees it is very difficult to you know analyze the real situation what was being experienced over the year some of the certain long term recommendations were made like conductive comprehensive damage uh, and loss assessment though it was a very small deviation we did do these are the some of the limitations we could have do relocation of the affected medical and educational facilities invest in research and early warning system because as compared to the early warning system we are currently implementing an early warning project with the government of rwanda but as compared to other things we are still lagging behind because we are having some technical gaps then in uh, then enhance community awareness strategy we have been that we also it is also we are a bit uh, lacking in that part establishing an intersectoral collaboration between ministry of emergency management and other departments and the higher education institution because so that the knowledge can be shared relocation of the properties along with the affected areas like you know because it has created a kind of a patch of gap from the volcanic eruption areas to tool the city of kigali we are not able to locate and identify the area but it has created there is a patch of gap you know the, the so the earth has divided it into parts in many places so that way it is also we need to also identify those areas in fact capacity building is a major you know kind of you know gap which we well, well experienced and uh, you now improve the regional collaboration with similar institution like you want to have a kind of a, you know uh, uh, inter you know collaboration with institution those who are existing at different level so that we can have a better knowledge and better techniques and technologies establishing geo hazard monitoring and the research center and that's what we are in the process we are also planning to establish a kind of a center of excellence on the drr so that you know all the knowledge uh, products can be well or can be done over here in organized planning based on the conduct research with uh, in association with the university round table discussion with uh, pdn uh, with the donors we had it we recently we did it with world bank and other development partners incorporation of volcanic eruption in uh, the, the this volcanic eruption also was suggested to you know in the national strategy for disaster reduction uh, risk reduction and formulated a national united nations disaster management team you know to ensure the united effort or united approach to address the issues some of the scopes it can be well discussed with our faculties like uh, who mainstream the drr into the subjects basically as i said from the beginning drr is not is everybody's business it is not one conducting the research conduct um, kind of innovations like bringing up various infrastructure modules and other things resilient infrastructures and engineering how the, the infrastructure can be more resilient and these things recently i was listening why the the temple in uh, the pospathinath temple didn't was not affected in the earthquake the severe earthquake that has happened in this uh, in, um, in nepal so that way we can uh, we can also take from the case studies how it can be these things i would also like to share recently the the cdri coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure has also announced some of the you now fellowships for the, the the faculties or for the the, the fellows so the, the duration of the, the fellowship is around one year and they provide 1000 uh, 15000 uh, us dollars to conduct uh, you know some of the thematic areas they have identified like early warning resilience standards nature based solutions risk finance and infrastructure health infrastructure resilience so these are the some of the areas you know they have uh, they are conducting they are giving a kind of a policy which may be beneficial to the academicians or the research scholars so that they can access this fund and given the link over here you can access these things thank you everybody these are the some of the selected references i have kept and i'll share this slide so that you can refer for future use with this i think i speak very fast i would apologize because uh, i think by culture we as uh, they speak very faster than the normal uh, these things so and uh, now i pass on my uh, these things to dr vidya kangrajan thank you thank you everybody
Thank you, sir. That was a very informative session. Now it's time for Q&A. I request the participants to please pose the questions in the chat box. I think the session was very hectic. No, sir, it was very informative. So, so I would like to ask a question. Yes, ma'am. So uh, we discussed about the researches on early warning systems, right? Yeah. So um, my question is how affordable it is to implement, especially in a country like India? Yeah, government of India is really working in in a, in a, in a more. Uh, it is working in various ways in in the uh, early warning system, and uh, government of India is well uh, with regard to you know, establishing early warning system in the country, and uh, we are well equi equipped. But how I think your question is how to bring it to the institutional level, how to link it with the institutional level, uh, this kind of things. I think uh, we have, uh, instead of me speaking on this area, I think uh, uh, honorable member, ex-former member, uh, Professor V.K. Menon is with us. I think I'll request him to you know to put some light on the questions raised by Ms. Kanagrajan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, I think on the early warning systems for every disaster typology, there have been a lot of effort in the various nodal agencies of the government of India trying to come up with uh, various solutions. So for floods, it is the Central Water Commission and the Ministry of Water Resources, which is actually providing uh, water level monitoring sensors in rivers and dams and so on. So for the earthquakes, it is the IMD, the Indian Meteorological Department, which is providing the seismographs and monitoring that with the, the National Seismology Center. Uh, and various other in, you know, institutional networks are there, like you have the INCOIS, the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Systems, uh, which is actually monitoring the tsunamis. And so you have different types of technologies which are being used, and because you are all you know, faculty members of different engineering institutions and, you know, civil engineers, structural engineers, geotechnical engineers, I'm sure there will be a lot of opportunities for you also to interact with, uh, you know, your students. IIT Bombay is conducting a program called e -Andra. I will share the link on the chat box. e -Andra has been doing, uh, you know, uh, the uh, training of uh, engineering students mentored by faculty members like you, you know, in different institutions in the country, hundreds of engineering institutions, including IITs, NITs, and engineering colleges, they are actually participating in the e antra Innovation Challenge. So last year, the Innovation Challenge was on disaster management. And so we had, you know, more than 1300 teams of engineering students from different engineering colleges, NITs, IITs, participating in that. And we had also participants from Bhutan, from Nepal, from Bangladesh, and from Brunei, and many other countries also participating. I will share some links. <coughs> I think it will be very useful if uh, some of the faculty members who are interested can do this, because it's a multidisciplinary kind of convergence which is needed in doing this kind of work because you will need uh, artificial intelligence, AI algorithms, you will need uh, robotics, you will need mechanical engineering, you will need embedded systems, you know, on hardware and also software solutions, in, including use of open access software solutions. Like you have the GitHub, you have the .API data sets and .CSV data sets and all that. So this is a very fascinating field and thank you uh, Bibuddi Bhushan Gannayak, you know, who is actually emerging as one of the senior uh, technical advisors of uh, DRM, Disaster Risk Management in the UNDP. And he is working in Rwanda, but uh, he has been involved in many countries and studied many reports. And we are very happy that, uh, you know, people like him 
are actually now the ambassadors of the country in spreading this concept of resilience building. And Rwanda is a country which has faced a genocide in 1994, where you know a, a lot of people, hundreds of thousands of people, among the the Tutsis and the Hutus, you know, they have actually lost their lives, and because of civil unrest which had happened. So conflict is there, you know. Uh, Earthquakes are there, cyclones are there, and so you have multiple disaster typologies, and you see that right now climate change. The sixth report of the IPCC talks about uh, you know the uh, the it has been mentioned as the code red for humanity by An Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN. So I think you know we all need to work on extreme events, climate change, and uh, disasters because we see that happening. You saw all the wildfires which are happening in Turkey, in Greece, in California, in Australia, in France. And you also see the kind of floods which are happening in London, in UK, in Austria, in, in China, in Henan, and also in many other parts of the world, including India. We've had severe floods happening in uh, Maharashtra. We lost uh, you know, a lot of people houses, landslides, and everything. So this is a very fascinating field, and I must compliment Vibhuti, uh, you know, for uh, triggering this very comprehensive session uh, by him covering a wide areas, wide set of issues, and also the videos, very, very cap capturing the kind of uh, lava flow which is happening. I think, you know, these are all things which you will actually need to understand that humanity is now at the crisis point you know we are on the tipping point where you know we need to really do something together collectively and academics have an important role to play thank you very much for this giving me this opportunity thank you thank you so much sir now we have got another question but can we predict disasters such as flood for any way to prediction Yes, the flood, we, we predict the flood before 72 hours, like mostly the hydrometeorological disasters are well predicted. The, the, we are well equipped because IMD, as uh, Professor Menon said, IMD is well equipped and uh, we are uh, issuing early warning before 72 hours in case of flood or cyclone. Um, this kind of hydrometeorological disasters are well predicted and early warning is being issued. And Government of India has already established the mechanism which is passing from the national level to till this um, uh, village level so that the, the information, because we implemented a program which is called DRM program way back in 2002 to 2009, I think. This program was implemented. It was supposed to be ended by 2008, but uh, uh, 2007, uh, but it ended, I think, 2009. So this uh, in this program, the system was well established and each district has developed their uh, district disaster management plan. Each block has developed their block disaster management plan. Each village has developed their block village disaster management plan. I think this program was also implemented in Kerala. Though around 2008 or uh, 9, the state disaster management, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority was established. But I think these activities were well done, uh, uh, implemented uh, these things. And the early warning system is well connected from the district level to from the national level to till district level, so that the information is reaching to each the uh, each people living in the collecting is ensuring the last mile connectivity. So that is what this for the, the hydrologic meteorological disaster early warning system is well established. In fact, uh, the, the uh, early warning with regard to earthquake and uh, this kind of volcanic eruption, we are still in the process. We are not able to know issue some kind of come out with some kind of early warning uh, kind of things. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, I'll request in case, sir, Professor Menon, if in case you can sir, add something, I'll request sir. Yeah, actually, you know, we find that Central Water Commission uh, has actually been providing this kind of early warning and alerts. Uh, Ministry of Water Resources has been doing that. IMD has the rainfall data. And uh, so the predictive modeling is also now becoming so real time with uh, now casting, which is, uh, you know, it's not 
forecasting. It's also now casting on real time. So when a cloud burst is likely to happen, you are actually able to see that in advance based on satellite imagery and remote sensing, and you are able to do that. Similarly, for floods, you know, you also have various ways by which uh, these sensors and, uh, you know, radars, which are actually also monitoring these kind of various situations can also provide this uh, information. Doppler radars have been providing, you know, information about uh, the cyclone uh, pathways. And so you can actually look at the, the, uh, the, when the landfall will take place, where it will take place, so that you know you can evacuate people. So when Cyclone Filing happened, more than a million people were evacuated in Orissa. And uh, the, because of this, you know, they were able to save lives and it was only about, uh, you know, 23 lives were lost in Orissa, you know, when Cyclone Filing came in 2013, compared to in 99, when the super cyclone happened, you know, more than 10,000 people lost their lives. So this is also a similar cyclone of a similar intensity. So I think early warning is very important. I would also like to suggest if time permits to also look at uh, the role of uh, technology in looking at IT enabled solutions, you know, so you have what is called the PS INSAR, which is, uh, you know, the, uh, it's not uh, LIDAR anymore. Uh, you know, you also have INSAR, which is actually the uh, the persistent scatter interferometry uh, looking at, uh, you know, synthetic aperture radars, which can actually, so PSNSAR is persistent scatter interferometry uh, using synthetic aperture radars. So you have uh, sentinel data of uh, satellite imageries you know, which can actually help you to look at deformations in critical infrastructure before, during, and after disasters. So before an earthquake or a tsunami or even, uh, you know, a hurricane, which are the uh, critical infrastructure which can actually get affected. So whether it is a high, you know, uh, whether it's a flyover or a dam or a, you know, um, a telecom infrastructure, how this act actually can get deformed. And so since uh, this question was asked about early warning, we could also look at uh, what is called the total electron content, TEC, you know, using ionosodes. Ionosodes can actually look at the total electron content in the ionosphere and then predict earthquakes, you know, even though everybody believes that earthquake cannot be predicted. So there are engineers in Japan and in Russia and in Israel who are actually working on what is called the TEC monitoring, tech monitoring, total electron content monitoring. And I'm a part of a, a peer committee on technological preparedness for national disruptions uh, set up by the Indian National Academy of Engineering, INAE, and the Niti IO. And so in that, we have the, been having these discussions with ISRO and with the Ministry of Earth Sciences. So I think as academics, you know, we need to really update ourselves in terms of these, you know, techniques which are available. So there is a lot of uh, possible convergence between, uh, you know, civil engineering, structural engineering, and geotechnical engineering, along with mechanical engineering and computer science and electronics. So I'm very happy that uh, MES College is actually conducting these FDPs, and I'll be very happy to be associated with these kind of events and. Uh, Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I request the participants to please post your questions in the chat box. Okay, so I guess it was elaborate enough that nobody is having any doubts. Thank you so much, sir. Now, I would like to invite Ms. Humeda Alhadi, FDP coordinator, to deliver the vote of thanks.
Thank you, Harada. So we are very grateful to you, sir, for joining with us today from your busy schedule. Actually, we are really enlightened and motivated with your knowledge and presence. And uh, regarding the session, it was very uh, informative. First, you reminded us about the flood in Kerala in 2018. That is a really tough time that we passed across. And uh, thereby, you give an idea about what is the need and importance of the speed DNA system, that is post-disaster need assessment. And you also give a clear-cut idea about the system or the process and what is the role of various stakeholders in the success of the PDNA system. So I wholeheartedly thankful to you, sir. Then uh, we are also very thankful for the effort you have made for joining with us in this uh, in this time. That is, uh, dear friends, he is in uh, he is in Africa now, and there is early morning there. And uh, I also thankful to you for that, sir. Uh, so we came. Uh, I also thankful to uh, we came in on, sir. That is. Um, the founder member of a disaster management authority. Uh, you are also joined with us, sir. Very thankful to you and for sparing your valuable time and uh, you uh, shared some informative, uh, informative knowledge, uh, informative session with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind support and presence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All Thank the best. You. Thank you, sir. And Professor Thank you so much, sir. Ta, Professor Labar said, and, you know, I'm very much closely involved with uh, the kind of work which is happening by the MES College and also by the MES Society uh, and Civil Engineering and very closely associated with the Government of Kerala's work in this uh, field of rebuilding Kerala. Uh, in the past uh, uh, floods and landslides, you know, both in Malapuram, Idiki, Wayanad, and all that, you know, I have been very closely associated with uh, many efforts happening, including the People's Foundation and also the kind of work which uh, institutions have been doing. I want to compliment all of you for the effort. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so there is some issue with the feedback form. I guess that will be uh, resolved by our uh, technical team soon. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, you, the session was really good and it is very evident from the smiles that everybody is keeping on their faces right now. So that's the end of today's first session. Hope all the participants can fill the feedback form soon. We'll join back at 11.15 a.m. Thank you all for joining on time and have a nice day. As uh, your my excuse me. So can I leave the session now? Oh yes, sir. I have to go to the field. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very much. Uh, with your permission, I will attend uh, some of the sessions whenever I have time. Is it okay? Oh, okay, sir. You can attend. Yeah, because, you know, the people who are actually discussing some of the sessions, the topics I saw that actually are interesting. And I know some of the people like Dr. Tara, you know, who was with the yeah. State yeah. Disaster Management Authority. So uh, whenever time permits, I know I will occasionally drop by and then you know, attend the sessions. Thank you. Thank okay, you. sir. Okay. Have a nice day. Thank you.
the participants. Uh, today's first session is over. We can join back at 11.15 a.m. Thank you.
Good morning, all. Once again, welcome back to the faculty development program. Good morning, ma'am. Now it's time to move to the second session. I request Ms. Humaydi Al Hadi to introduce the speaker. Ma'am, please. Thank you, Harita. Good morning, ma'am. I'm really delighted to introduce today's second speaker, who is from our MES family, Dr. Prasanna Tiki. She is currently the director and head of the MES School of Architecture. <clears throat> she has about 30 years of experience, both in the field of teaching and industry. She is a member of Board of Studies of University of Calicut and Kuching University of Science and Technology, and also Doctor Committee member of Sathibama University, Chennai. A number of papers have been presented by presented and published by Ma in various areas like sustainable architecture, environmental quality in built areas, architecture design process, art in architecture, etc. She is also the certified registered architect by the Council of Architecture and also member of Institute of Teachers of Science and Technology. We are really fortunate to have Ma in this session to deliver a talk on the topic architecture adaptation strategy to mitigate climate change. Ma'am, you may please start the session. Thank you, Ms. Huminka, and thank you, Ms. Harita. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yeah, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Yeah. Yesterday was September 5th. So, uh, belated greetings to all the teachers who are present here. Uh, since this is a short-term program, I think uh, most of the uh, participants will be from the teaching fraternity. Uh, we will go straight to the presentation uh, so that uh, we do not miss any time.
Ma'am has lost the connection. She'll be connecting soon. Oh, sorry for the delay. Before that, for the smooth conduct of the program, I would like every attendees are requested to mute their mic and please do not present your screen in between. Questions are to be posted in the chat box. The organizing team will present the questions to the speaker at the end of the session. The speaker will answer all questions if the time permits. If you need any assistance during the program, please use the chat box. Kindly fill up the feedback forms after each session. The link of the feedback forms will be shared in the chat box. Live streaming for the program will be available on YouTube. Let's please wait till Nam join. Thank you.
Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes, you're very old. Yeah. Where did we, where did I, I mean, where did I lose my connection? From starting on. Oh, 
Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. You're not seeing my slides also? It's not presenting, ma'am, now. Present it. Yeah, now it's okay. Visible now. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, I mean, were we not able to listen to uh, anything or uh, from the first slide, slide? Okay. Pardon? No. From the first slide onwards, your uh, your connection is lost. Yeah. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, is there any problem, ma'am? No, there is some problem with connectivity. I'm reconnecting. Yeah. Okay. 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 Sorry. It said that it was uh, our uh, system mistake. My God. I was speaking for 30 minutes into nothing. So, I mean, I had at length explained uh, the uh, whole thing, but I don't think we should be wasting more time. So, this is the content uh, of uh, what we'll be discussing today. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. ma'am. Yes. <clears throat> This is the definition of uh, disaster as given by WHO. Uh, as a, as a disaster is a sudden calamitous event that seriously disrupts the functioning of a community or society and causes human material and economic and environmental losses that exceeds the community's or the society's ability to cope using its own resources. So, though um, disasters has always uh, been, I mean, always is a natural event, its effect on uh, earth and humans are exaggerated by human interventions. Since I already explained all this, uh, and I don't think uh, we need to go uh, much in depth of this because uh, the later part of this is what is more architectural oriented. So what is specific about this is many of these terms like tsunami and cloudburst is something which we uh, heard for the first time in the past uh, uh, two decades, like we have not heard about tsunami prior to 2004 or cloud burst prior to 2013, though we heard it again in Kerala in 2000, uh, though, it can, uh, though I do not know whether it is actually cloud burst, but uh, unprecedented rates over short period of time. And uh, we also have uh, state specific disasters like uh, Kerala has coastal erosion, some parts of uh, uh, Rajasthan and uh, Gujarat. Uh, which falls under the hot arid uh, climate will have a heat wave and uh, some of the zones are very uh, specific to uh, having uh, strong winds and lightning and so on. So these are all specific state specific disasters and uh, why in India it becomes such a major issue is because uh, we have gone around building our uh, habitats and uh, uh, buildings uh, and uh, residences in vulnerable and coastal areas. And also we have uh, um, planned our settlements in such a way that uh, uh, there is a lot of flooding which happens. The, there is a pro, uh, the, we are not, we have not been uh, much bothered about uh, the rainfall which falls on the ground and which sinks, which should sink into the ground and the high population density which uh, India and also China has. Uh, <coughs> China and India uh, are the hardest hit apart from USA uh, the, as the most affected uh, places in uh, most affected nations uh, by disasters in the past two decades. Uh, this is a United Nations Office for Disaster Risk De Reduction and uh, this data is from that particular source. And though it is uh, hard to believe that, uh, uh, I mean, how do they define disasters and how other countries are facing it. But according to this particular uh, uh, report, you will find that uh, China and India have taken the hardest hit post-2000. 
And um, in China, we have around 100, 577 uh, disasters in past 20 years. Whereas in India, we had 321 uh, disasters, uh, amounting to 79 plus odd people losing their lives and uh, 108 crore people being affected by it. Uh, this is because this number is because of the uh, disaster happening in the same location over a period of time. We always associated flooding with uh, the Himalayan uh, uh, belt because uh, uh, because of the shallow rivers of uh, uh, Brahmaputra, uh, tributaries of Brahmaputra and some tributaries of Yamuna. Whereas, uh, uh, but we experienced uh, uh, flooding in Kerala in 2018. So, some of the five top disasters in India uh, from the past two decades are uh, listed here. Mm, I had explained it in detail. Now I do not want to spend much time on this. And uh, most of it is because of the torrential rainfall or rainfall which happens over a period of time, short period of time, uh, incessant rains and causing flooding, landslides, uh, and so on. <clears throat> this is the. These are two pictures from uh, the Kerala floods of 2018 and 19, where, uh, as you can see. Uh, the state of Kerala saw the one of the worst uh, disasters post in the past one century due to various reasons. Due to various reasons, like one of the reasons was uh, poor water management. The other was uh, uh, the uh, state receiving unprecedented rains over short spells of time. Uh, in the month of June 2018, we received a 15% percent, uh, percentage increase in, from the normal rainfall of 649.8 mm. And uh, in the month of July 18, so already the uh, ground was uh, swelling up with water. And in the fort first fortnight of August, we had around 164 percentage of uh, increase from the normal rainfall, and which led to uh, opening up of all the dams and uh, creating such a havoc in the it is believed that all the 14 districts, or it is recorded that all the 14 districts of Kerala and 60% of the population were affected by floods in 2018. Whereas in 2019, situation uh, again pointed to the human intervention, uh, like uh, how the deforestation and the subsequent soil erosion and uh, shifting from uh, uh, ground cover, which is na natural and native to a place, to mono cultural plantations led to such a uh, huge landslide in the district of Trichur in the place called Kavalapara. So still, uh, I happened to travel on that particular uh, area and you won't believe the kind of uh, soil which was generated by this landslide had extended kilometers uh, away from the source. So you could understand uh, um, what kind of implications disasters can have on normal life and even on environment and ecology. So why are we discussing uh, disasters is because uh, the, why are we discussing climate change is because the climate change is de definitely linked to disasters. Uh, the climate change is, uh, uh, refers to the significant changes in global temperature, whether it is uh, precipitation, wind patterns, and other measures of climate that occur every several decades or longer. Then, uh, but whenever we discuss, if you look at this particular graph, you will find that uh, this is the graph which explains uh, uh, the variations in climate from 1900 to 2000. Uh, as you all know, weather conditions, weather is something which, uh, <coughs> which will have variations from uh, hour to hour, day to day. Um, and uh, climate is a consolidation of these weather conditions. Though weather con uh, conditions are not very predictable, you will find that uh, climatic conditions are quite predictable. And the entire planning of the uh, nation, uh, whether it is agriculture, production, mining, everything is dependent on these climatic patterns. So you will find that over a period of time, the, uh, the uh, natural factors alone, if we just had the natural factors alone, the green line, you will find the variations would have, or the change, increase in the temperature would have remained quite uh, steady. But with human intervention, you will find that uh, the graph is going up, and we are almost here at 1.2 degrees centigrade of uh, increase in temperature in the entire globe. 
then effects of climate change can be very uh, varied and uh, you will find uh, uh, these are all various things which have been listening again and again like disappearing glaciers will cause uh, sea level uh, in higher uh, sea level increase and <coughs> uh, but uh, something which is wait hello very good morning ma'am i am anbu calling you from the akshay please Kandra, i am in a meeting i am in a meeting i thought i again lost connection so uh, the last two the last two uh, effects of climate change has been the allergies and asthma and infectious diseases uh, which many of the children and the adults face in the past two decades you will see, see the number of people who are facing having these problems have increased multifold because of the kind of uh, uh, natural changes and also because of uh, uh, higher levels of air pollution uh, caused by these changes and also other kind of human interventions and which are favorable to pathogens and mosquitoes so this uh, you will understand in the current situation the kind the pathogens which we are uh, affected with the pandemic of covid-19 and uh, the nipa and various other diseases which were never ever heard before uh, we are seeing it again and again happening in uh, again in the country and in the world so greenhouse gases are gases that trap heat into the atmosphere therefore contributing to warming up of the planet these why uh, i already had explained i don't think i will go into detail greenhouse gases you will know that uh, so sun is our major source of energy and uh, the sun's radiation falls in, on earth and gets reflected back to a very large extent if you uh, leave it as it is uh, the problem is there are certain radiations of uh, sun which are harmful to atmosphere which get blocked by uh, gases like ozone the ozone layer and there are certain uh, gases all these uh, gases if you look at all these greenhouse gases uh, these are the five uh, top green uh, greenhouse gases and you will find that uh, nitrous oxide carbon dioxide methane and water vapor uh, are have been always here due to various agricultural and uh, other things they have been increased in their uh, uh, quantum uh, because of human interventions like nitrous oxide because of uh, fertilizer application carbon dioxide of because of uh, because of burning of fossil fuels methane because of uh, various uh, agricultural activity cattle uh, dairy farming and so on but the uh, the gas as chlorofluorocarbon is a synthetic gas which we use in our aerosols and air conditionings uh, which cause the depletion of the ozone layer and cause more damage and permits more solar radiation to filter into earth so uh, this is uh, i think i stop here uh, this is uh, this is this particular uh, this particular uh, graphics demonstrate what will happen what has happened in uh, climatically for the entire globe in the past 20 past 25 years from 86 to 2005 and uh, what will happen if we go unabated like this till 2100 i'm sure that none of us will live to see this day because uh, human should have been extinct if we go in for an increase of 11 degree uh, rise in temperature again with precipitation you will find that uh, the variations in precipitations what will happen from uh, 1986 to 2005 and uh, you can see uh, areas which will go into droughts and uh, intense rainfall periodic uh, wetter areas uh, in fewer locations and so on so how are we responsible as architects and uh, engineers in uh, involved in the building and construction industry we we'll, uh, the data shows that 39% of the carbon emissions globally uh, are because of uh, building and construction industries and out of which 28% is because of the way we have built our structures and the way we are operating and maintaining our buildings in the sense that uh, the, we burn fossil fuels to keep ourselves warm to move our vehicles and power factories and in the process a lot of carbon dioxide and other gases are released that have an impact on global warming and 11% is because of the embodied carbon uh, which cannot be attributed 
uh, as uh, stronger like uh, this uh, operation and maintenance because once uh, any building once you uh, try to construct a building you will definitely have uh, you will definitely use materials which will have embodied garden carbon so <clears throat> this is an unless you choose your materials very carefully and see to it that you keep the uh, carbon uh, you you choose materials which have low embodied carbon you will find that uh, this becomes uh, uh, this becomes uh, uh, quite inevitable uh, and uh, we cannot be using the same materials which we are using uh, uh, say five decades back because of uh, shortages and other things but we definitely can contribute to operation maintenance by uh, designing our buildings correctly and seeing to it that we design our habitat uh, so that we don't have to move our vehicles and power factories and harnessing our energy from sources which does not again uh, burn the fossil fuels so buildings embodied carbon comes from the manufacture and supply of construction products and materials as well as the construction process itself mm. <clears throat> by reducing embodied carbon the negative impacts on global warming caused by buildings can be limited both by embodied carbon and by operation and maintenance and the first step to do is to uh, in uh, is to go in for a net zero carbon building that is a building which will have uh, through the course of its uh, life cycle green gas emissions from all sources sum up to zero you do not end up with uh, creating any amount of or releasing any amount of carbon into the atmosphere from its uh, uh, pre building stage to post building stage and uh, the next step is to build a net positive or energy positive building see to it that you the buildings envelop and the roof uh, create enough energy and uh, uh, do not use uh, consume so much of uh, power in order for uh, for it to maintain human habitation inside by way of operation and maintenance and it produces more energy and consumes to make up for the energy used to construct it even the energy which is used to construct it has to be uh, made up by the amount of uh, has to be made up by the amount of energy you will be harnessing through the entire life of the building and uh, by the time the uh, building ends its life it should have had a net positive it should have contributed to energy rather than consuming energy so this is a slide which i showed to my first year students uh, of defining architecture uh, and which is uh, i think i keep telling my students to look at it every year and uh, how their perceptions uh, perceptions change the uh, architecture is a space structure and enclosure which we experience through movement in time and space achieved by means of technology accommodating a program compatible with its context this is the most important thing in what context are we building are we building compatible to the context so in the context we have the location which is a site and the environment we have the climatic factors which is a sun wind and precipitation we have the geographical factors like the uh, soil topography water and vegetation and we have the visual factors like uh, views the sensory factors like uh, sense of place views and uh, sound if you look at how traditionally we used to build uh, in india uh, there was a thorough understanding of the classification of climate in india and the climatic considerations played a big role in the vernacular architecture of india you have uh, india is uh, divided according to copen gregor classification of climate in india india is divided into majorly eight climatic zones uh, and <coughs> which are the tropical monsoon the entire uh, western west to the western ghats uh, of coastal kerala karna coastal karnataka maharashtra and goa will fall under this then the and other part of the peninsula major part of the peninsula india except for a few pockets like this will fall into tropical savanna our the more uh, popular way of understanding it is the warm humid zones and uh, you had uh, <coughs> the arid steep and hot climate which is what you see in some part of karnataka and maharashtra and uh, uh, gujarat madhya pradesh and himachal pradesh those areas and uh, the hot arid uh, hot arid desert zone of rajasthan and uh, rajasthan and gujarat so these are the major climatic zones and then we had a temperate uh, dry winter and hot summer 
uh, very close to your Himalayan ranges and uh, temperate dry winter and warm uh, summer on the upper part of the Himalayan ranges. We also, there is also one more climatic uh, zone which is the cold, dry and warm summer which we do not see much in, in the Indi sub Indian subcontinent. You also have a very small pocket of uh, temperate climate in uh, uh, close to your western guards within the Tamil Nadu region. So this is uh, the climatic classification of India. And let us see two examples, uh, one from the hot uh, arid zone, hot arid desert zone of uh, Rajasthan with a specific example of uh, Jay Salma and uh, another from uh, the warm humid zone of Trivandrum. So this is, uh, this is the picture of uh, Jay Salma, the, uh, one aerial view showing how the urban settlement has uh, developed over a period of time. Uh, looking at the climatic data, we will find that uh, uh, the minimum temperature goes to uh, 10 degrees and uh, I mean the average temperature, uh, the average temperature is somewhere around 10 degrees, uh, 15 degrees with a min minimum going to below uh, somewhere around 10 degrees and maximum going to somewhere around uh, uh, 20 to 25 degrees in the month of January, going to a peak of around uh, 40 degrees uh, in the summer month of May and June, when uh, the minimum remains somewhere around 25. So what happens here is that uh, you have a good diurnal range. Now, the diurnal range between, that is the difference of temperature between the maximum and the minimum is quite high which can be utilized for storing up the uh, storing up the heat and then transferring it during night time and then the humidity but here is uh, very low uh, up from 45 to a maximum of uh, 70 uh, i mean 65 uh, percentage in the months when we when they are receiving the monsoon so this this is the basis on which the entire settlement has been uh, designed uh, they had extreme high summer temperatures, low humidity and precipitation, high diurnal wind, and they also had, they also have dust storms and reflected lighting. <coughs> Most of the surfaces in the desert region reflect and cause a lot of glare, not not majorly from the sun, uh, but majorly as a reflected lighting from other surfaces. So, how did they respond in terms of uh, settlement? Uh, they they constructed buildings so that you will have minimum surface exposure. And they use buildings uh, in such a manner that uh, they will shade each other because you will not find much of uh, vegetation here, especially within the urban area. Uh, you will find that the buildings shade each other, and they not only shade each other, they, they also shade the uh, they also shade the streets. So it becomes possible for <coughs> for any kind of uh, societal activities and for the private activities to happen and. Uh, and if you look at the Haveli in uh, uh, Jai Salma, you will find that most of the houses, whether it is small, big, middle, or higher income group, you will find that most of the houses had a courtyard. And uh, if you look at the entire uh, uh, Indian subcontinent, house was majorly uh, prayer. Uh, house was majorly a place where uh, they stored uh, their goods and also for their very private activities. Otherwise, uh, India has got a very high level of communal living. So you will find that many of these uh, areas, uh, even sleeping activity at night happens during the open. So most of the houses in courtyard will, I mean, most of the houses in uh, Jai Salma used to have uh, courtyards and uh, which led to uh, evaporative cooling, number one, if it had a well or a water source or uh, what happened is uh, they, they when I mean, if you look at uh, these kind of houses, you will find that the openings to the street is very limited in order to prevent sun from entering. And uh, as you all know, prior to the uh, prior to our industrial age, we hardly had a material called glass. So all this was covered either by windows or by jollies. So and the jollies were uh, good because even it it sort of uh, manipulated the microclimate and regulated the kind of amount of sunlight which have, uh, flows into the it falls into the uh, falls into the habitable spaces. So and. Uh, if you look at, uh, you can see the uh, thickness of the roof. They had very high thick roof, uh, very thick roofs and very uh, thick walls, which used to store the heat during uh, the day and release it during night because uh, their the ventilation or their uh, 
air exchanges or their wind patterns were not very strong like the warm humid regions. So if you if you just uh, summarize, uh, the buildings had high thermal mass and uh, which led to night ventilation. And because of the thermal mass, you had cool air generated from the uh, cool air generated from the uh, courtyard and other spaces, and which flew through all these smaller openings. Which uh, and most of you will know that uh, when the when you have bigger inlets and smaller outlets, the speed of the wind increases. So all this was incorporated in the design of houses. Then. Uh, Minimized insulation with narrow street. Uh, most of the streets were very narrow, and uh, they were also oriented. Uh, they were also oriented uh, north south, uh, north south, so that uh, the buildings, the streets were all oriented. Uh, you can see the streets are all oriented north south, and in order to catch the prevailing wind, they also had a slight tilt in some of these. This is the urban area of Jaisalma. And uh, you can see the high density of uh, uh, housing with very narrow streets and uh, permitting a lot of shading which is happening between the buildings. And if you look at the buildings, uh, this is uh, uh, not only specific to uh, hot dry, also you'll find that uh, you will uh, see that most of the houses in Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, where uh, these, these kind of towns, uh, dense towns are there, you will have uh, you will have buildings or you will have habitats which are deeper than wider. So this is the uh, frontage to the this is the frontage to the street. And whether the house was small or uh, belonged to the middle income group or to the higher income group, you will find that they always had a courtyard. And uh, courtyard regulated the microclimate to a very large extent and uh, pr uh, permitted uh, wind flows and uh, evaporative coolings throughout the day and night. And uh, <coughs> This is a few of the houses, uh, class, uh, this is an urban cluster, which you can see here, with uh, very narrow, the major roads and the minor alleys, which uh, permit uh, minimum surface exposure into this, uh, which prevent uh, um, exposure or surface exposure into sun's radiation, uh, permits uh, some kind of, uh, uh, permits some kind of shading to the streets, and uh, um, the lighting again since the streets were very narrow um, courtyards also used uh, were used in order to uh, use as a lighting source for the entire house a very kind of diffuse lighting and uh, the ventilation was always through the courtyard and uh, evaporating cooling from courtyard and uh, if you look at materials and thicknesses the walls uh, uh, were up to 0.45 meet, uh, meters, that is 45 centimeters to 55 centimeters in thickness. And the uh, roof had thick vaulted roof, or it even had uh, pots embedded in them for air cavity. And uh, there were mud roofs on, uh, the roofs were made of uh, mud roofs on timber beams, uh, and the walls were made out of bricks set on edge with strong line master, plaster. So, and the windows, windows had wooden shutters, whatever, whichever windows they had, and they also had jallies. You can see the windows here. Uh, and uh, they also permitted, they had windows at various levels. You can see in this particular, uh, uh, in this particular uh, picture, you have windows for views, you have windows for hot air to rise and escape. You also had these smaller openings permitting the cold air to enter into the building. And... Uh, the whole thing, the whole uh, urban fabric was so aesthetically done that you had a lot of textured walls, which again reflected most of the sun radiation which was falling on the surfaces. So, and uh, these are two openings used on the residence on the lower floors and uh, openings used on the higher floors. So, you had possibility if you if a, if a, it, it also uh, responded to various social and cultural requirements uh, like uh, uh, like the women could sit here and uh, watch the happenings without being observed and so on so it it is uh, it is such a manifestation of various socio cultural climatic uh, factors uh, with the available building materials which is uh, which is uh, present within, say, five kilometers or uh, 10 kilometers within the locality. So the next uh, <coughs> climatic type which we'll discuss is the tropical monsoon. 
tropical monsoon is something which we face uh, uh, every day so uh, we can see the uh, we are in the month of uh, september still the southwest monsoon uh, has not stopped again the temp climatic variations which has happened uh, we did not receive much month in the much rain in the month of august and the rainy season is extending into the month of uh, september this is uh, this is what is available as data here what you see is that you do not have much diurnal variation the difference in temperature between the night and the uh, day between the night and the day is very small so you just cannot uh, have massive walls which will uh, store the uh, heat and re radiate it into the house at night what you require is uh, walls uh, which are which have high level of fenestration so that uh, you permit air exchanges you find that uh, uh, most of the houses in kerala or in trivandrum specific in uh, kerala or in the coast entire coast of uh, peninsular india this is the housing typology which was developed lot of fenestrations on openings you uh, and uh, most of the houses whether it was a small uh, uh, for the smaller income groups or the middle income groups they they were of detached houses like the taravadus and homesteads of kerala are very famous because it's it has a beautiful setting of uh, landscape and the house what is this house sits uh, with with lot of open area around and uh, <coughs> there was lot of vegetation all around therefore yeah. you will find uh, that uh, the vegetation itself provided a lot of uh, uh, yeah, shading to the building yes hello am i audible yes ma'am you are audible yeah. uh, the vegetation itself provided a lot of uh, shade onto the building and uh, um, you had good possibilities of uh, lighting and ventilation because uh, you did not have much uh, uh, intervention from neighboring buildings and uh, mm, all this was considered in you know, when a building was oriented here again you will find that uh, uh, the major orientation is towards uh, north south so that uh, major orientation is towards north south so that uh, you have minimum interference from east and west this is a typical uh, courtyard or, or what what we call an etiquette uh, where again you can see that uh, courtyard is a feature which is what is happening courtyard is a feature which is uh, again used as a built uh, special organizer and a built element and uh, most of the uh, if you look at all these individual habitable spaces it will have only one layer rather than the stacking which is happening in the hot arid zone which prevented solar irradiation here the wind factor is very high uh, and you also had a, uh, glare factor so you will find verandas all around the building you also had courtyard with these two elements there was only one single leaf of uh, single leaf of habitable space in the wherever you see you see only one leaf of habitable space this is a courtyard this is a courtyard these are all courtyards so you will find only single leaf therefore you will find the uh, air has got a tendency to rush through this habitable space to the courtyard and uh, escape so this ensured that there is a lot of air movement within the house which was again facilitated by the kind of fenestrations uh, very large fenestrations again uh, having uh, uh, i mean again shaded by uh, a huge overhang of the building so from the roof so courtyard plan facilitate high rates of ventilation external shading provided by thick vegetation all around courtyard plan facilitated evaporative cooling and verandas all around uh, high fenestration ratio then yes if you look at this uh, we will be seeing more uh, pictures of houses we had this kind of gable windows gables and gable windows these gables permitted all the hot air which is entering the building to escape number 1 number 2 because of the kind of roof the roof was sometimes as high as 6 meters and because of the high roof <coughs> was a lot of thermal comfort within the house and uh, on the top of the upper last floor that is it is a ground floor this had an attic space 
this attic space not only was used as a storage uh, space but also was a air buffer to prevent the solar radiation from entering into the building uh, through the day and uh, whatever uh, openings which are required uh, to for the hot air to rise up at the night so low and you will find that some of these houses had uh, thick uh, laterite walls with a high thermal capacity in the sense that laterite is a material which has got of air cavities and uh, Mm, which doesn't permit heat to get uh, uh, transmitted easily. Upper floor spaces walls low thermal mass uh, because of construction ease and also because uh, you do not have the radiated energy from the earth. And uh, most of the roofs had highly pitched uh, uh, tile roof. And uh, the tile, if you see, is a very thin material, unlike uh, the thrown uh, roofs of the Rajasthan. Here it is a very thin material. So whatever heat was gained during the night was radiated out at night. I mean, whatever heat which was gained during the day was radiated at night. Uh, these are some typical examples of uh, uh, low-income uh, houses, what are called the chalas of uh, Kerala, where the wall is made of uh, either mud or stone, depending on availability, and the roof is uh, thatch or any kind other kind of agricultural waste like uh, coconut palm, uh, palm, and so on. And uh, but whatever be the material, it, it had a st uh, steep pitch in order to shed the precipitation, which was very high. And uh, these are some of the other uh, uh, other uh, uh, typologies of houses. Egashala, that is uh, a house which had uh, one one linear element. Again, you can see the upper floor and uh, the huge uh, roof, uh, the huge airspace which is uh, above the topmost roof and uh, the uh, kind of uh, overhangs it had which protected the walls, uh, the fenestrations and uh, the kind of trellis which was used on the upper floors. This is an example from, um, from, up, um, from the northern Kerala. This is an example from the southern Kerala. Again, you can see the variation in the kind of uh, construction uh, technology. Uh, here the gables, you can see the gable roof, uh, gable windows uh, are getting protection because of the kind of the roof profile. When two of these egashalas come together, it was called a puti kettle. And uh, these are the various kind of manas or the, uh, the major taravados which uh, uh, of uh, erstwhile Kerala. Uh, the examples are given here. And uh, you here again, you will find that uh, uh, you do not have the entire uh, built material here is wood. And uh, here is wood so that uh, you do not permit uh, heat to build up over there. Whereas here you find, uh, uh, here you do not see much of a veranda, but uh, you can see that uh, the verandas are, have been enclosed by uh, the trellis work. Whereas here you have the veranda which is open and the upper floors being built and uh, you can see the windows just below the roof to permit the hot air to escape. So, and after having such a rich tradition of uh, built elements, what exactly are we building now? If you look at any of these malls which are getting built, uh, in whether it is in Jaipur or Delhi or Chennai or uh, Trivandrum, you will find that the um, the urban fabric or the architectural palette seems to be the same. Lot of uh, glass, lot of uh, aluminium cladded panels, and uh, uh, the side being used 100% uh, uh, in order to build up. That is, your building footprint is going to take up 100% of the site. You need not be fooled by all this uh, landscape you will find that uh, you may have a basement parking or if this particular surface is uh, paved with impervious um, or if this surface is paved with impervious surfaces not even one uh, drop of water is going to uh, penetrate into the soil uh, even if you have uh, even if you argue that you have rainwater harvesting systems the sunlight is not going to penetrate the soil so you are taking away when you are building the building uh, rules say that uh, you, you build only 60% of the entire site but what in effect is happening is that the entire 100% of the site is losing its uh, uh, connection with the natural uh, elements. So, if in, um, look at the building typology which was required in the modern times. You required high-rise structures for residential commercial purposes because uh, people were migrating from rural areas to urban areas and uh, yeah, there was a creation of a lot of jobs. Uh, white white collar jobs and uh, blue collar jobs where uh, you require a space in order to work and uh, you required you found out new ways of recreating yourself uh, and uh, having uh, 
active recreation and uh, sorry passive recreation and uh, because of this you ended up making skyscrapers and glass towers to match the buildings which were be built in the west so if you look at the uh, consider climatic consideration the uh, the consideration for sun is nil you will find that uh, the building is having opening on almost all the sides uh, whether it is even if you think this is uh, this is not this is not uh, both on the south and the east is going sorry west is going to have south and west is going to have glass if you look at this you are going to use uh, aluminum cladding and glass which permitting uh, light and even in the roof it has glass so permitting air to uh, sorry solar radiation to penetrate um, through the even through the roof and uh, sun is permitted to fall on op all openings and there is hardly any shading devices at every level you just have this uh, overhangs at the top level uh, for whatever reasons and then you will find that the entire surface is uh, left to receive radiation throughout the day and uh, wind is not permitted because everything has got a glass facade and uh, uh, therefore depending on the heating and ventilating air conditioning systems uh, no climatic consideration towards uh, precipitation uh, you are permitting the rain to fall on all surfaces without any kind of shading devices thereby uh, creating a threat posing a threat to the building materials which are used definitely the building materials will have less durability if it is not well protected and uh, as uh, as i was telling earlier uh, a building uh, when the building regulations say that you can build only 60% what is uh, uh, implicit in that uh, is that you have a building footprint of only 60% whereas uh, when you do these kind of uh, modulations you will find that you are using the building for uh, you are using the site 100% for a build, building and related activities uh, and uh, you are depriving the natural conditions for the soil for it and uh, the one more problem which you are creating is you are going to shed all the rainwater which is falling into the building onto the uh, adjoining road creating some kind of an urban flood contributing to urban flooding and uh, this also has got other uh, socio cultural factors because needs of the people have changed as i was telling uh, earlier the economic requirements are different your social requirements are different and uh, th this has caused a lot of change in the lifestyles and the choice of materials we definitely cannot make build only with um, laterite and mud there has been new materials but uh, the the choice of the materials uh, has been poor in these cases and uh, whereas you can look at possibility of uh, other recyclable materials to be used as enclosing elements and then uh, the aesthetic expectations of people are different uh, you want to have uh, uh, like uh, the what is uh, considered as development is uh, uh, or what is considered as whether your town is uh, up to date is having these kind of malls so there are also socio cultural factors and also political factors uh, economic factors so the factors which affect microclimate are uh, as uh, already discussed it is the sun wind and uh, precipitation sun not only brings heat and light but it also brings glare uh, wind uh, there are variations between day and night and uh, there are also wind patterns which are annual there are wind patterns which are created by uh, urban island heat island effects and uh, there are also um, eddy currents which are created again by buildings precipitation is associated with wind and uh, otherwise uh, the driven rain and the possum so what a architect or a uh, person associated with construction has in his palette when he starts designing a building is uh, uh, the site the site will have all these features and uh, what is within the designer's control is area and local climate but uh, that is what the site gives you but how to space and orient the building is with, is for the designer to decide your site surroundings what is there in terms of vegetation neighborhood uh, neighborhood uh, buildings uh, neighborhood features is what the site provides you how you do you create the location uh, open spaces in order to uh, exploit it to the maximum is uh, the, within the designer's pre uh, remit and uh, the site shape uh, we, today we know especially in kerala we have such a huge shortage of land so you cannot be 
very particular that you will design only in a very uh, in a peculiar or a very neutral square or a very perfect golden rectangle but uh, definitely you can modulate the form and height of the building according to the shape which is available and uh, what is outside the designer's control again is your topographical features and uh, what you can actually do uh, within that is the fenestration tree cover and the ground profiling. And uh, we have no control on the surrounding buildings, but we can definitely create uh, surrounding surfaces in reciprocal to that and in wind breakers and all these elements in reciprocation to what is available. Then, uh, what's the time? Uh, improving microclimate through design. What are the ways in which you can improve the microclimate is uh, by reducing cost of uh, winter heating, which is not uh, very particular to our climate. Uh, unless you are in North India, we, we see to it that uh, the um, cost of winter heating is reduced by, by absorbing radiation when it is necessary. And also seeing to that you have buffer the uh, heat during summer, reduce summer overheating and the need for cooling. So you, any building uh, which is to be built where you have a uh, hot temperate climate or a composite climate having both extreme summer and extreme winter will be a trade-off between how to reduce cost in winter heating and how to reduce uh, cost in summer uh, cooling. And uh, maximize outdoor comfort in summer and winter. Uh, uh, as a culture, we always have lived in the outdoors. It is only in the past uh, few decades we have moved indoors. And uh, in the past uh, one year, we have totally been within indoors. So it is uh, better for uh, um, the next generation to become healthier, to see to it that your out outdoor comfort, that is your building does not create situations where the outdoor comfort is compromised. By using uh, materials like uh, ACP, uh, aluminum cladding panel, what you do is you increase the summer the temperature outside the building by, by up, up to even 5 degree. By putting all the air conditioning vents into the outdoor area, you will find that you are again increasing the temperature of the outdoor by a few degrees centigrade. So you will have to design in uh, in such a manner that these comforts, uh, the outdoor comforts is never compromised when we are designing habitable spaces. And then improve durability of building material. You see to it that the rain penetration is kept minimum. And uh, you also protect the building materials, use materials which are uh, provide enough uh, uh, protection for the building material by various means, by, by built elements, by paints, and so on. And uh, provide a better visual environment in spaces around buildings. This is uh, understanding the aesthetics of uh, how the building integrates with the site. And uh, see to it that there is a good visual environment. If there is something available in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, views, in terms of uh, features, you see to it that your building responds to that and uh, plant the buildings along with the plants. Uh, encourage growth of plants and uh, never, I mean, the good architects never cut plants or trees in order to build. Then uh, discourage growth of mosses and algae. Uh, see to it that you have surfaces which are. Then means of enhancing the microclimate around the building will include allow maximum daylight into space and buildings in the, for uh, so that you do not spend much on lighting and allow maximum solar radiation into space and building in the sense that uh, it should it, the both should be both should be optimum uh, it should not be maximum depending on the climate and the requirement you see to it that uh, uh, you permit daylight and solar radiation into the uh, spaces and shade uh, space and windows from prolonged exposure to summer sun and protect space and windows from glare. And uh, wind protection requires uh, protection from prevailing winds and uh, driven rain and uh, prevent buildings in order to uh, generate turbulence and protect spaces and buildings from driving rain, rain and falling snow. And the features provide thermal mass to moderate extreme temperatures depending on, again on climate and use vegetation for sun shading and wind protection. Uh, because uh, not only uh, water, but also vegetation by transpiration modulates the microclimate to a very large extent. Then provided surfaces that drain readily in the sense that don't provide uh, uh, clogging of water, which will create uh, other pathogen generation and provide water for uh, cooling by way of foundation. 
So is it possible to do all that within one building? Uh, we'll just look at a study of uh, one of the buildings uh, done uh, by architect Karan Grover in the year 2004, uh, the Center for uh, <coughs> Confederation of Indian Industries Building uh, by Sorabji, Sorabji Godrej Green Business Center. This is a center which advocates other people in uh, environmental protection, um, alternative sources of uh, uh, energy, uh, alternatives building construction techniques and so on. And true to what they were advocating, they had put up a building which is uh, which you can see uh, on your screen. So what you see here is a building which has been uh, done in uh, five acres, but uh, uh, they have not gone to exploit the FSI to the maximum. They have built only 20,000 square feet. And uh, uh, this is one of the buildings which received the platinum rating, uh, the first building to receive platinum rating outside uh, uh, outside I mean, US. So uh, in the, uh, which received the lead platinum rating, which is the energy and the environmental design. Then, uh, what they had done as uh, features is uh, they had, as uh, mentioned earlier, like they had built up only 20,000 square feet in a site extent of five acres. So you had large areas for landscape in order to enhance the microclimate. 66% of the material which was used uh, within the, uh, um, for the construction of the buildings was from within 800 kilometers. So you did not have uh, transportation embodied energy into the building. And 95% of the raw materials were harvested locally. Mm, again, uh, going to uh, not only to 60 percent, most of the buildings was harvested very, very close to the site, and 77 percent of the building materials used recycled content like uh, the fly ash and the GGDS. Uh, and uh, the concrete used in the building had 15 percent fly ash and 20 percent GGBS. Uh, fly ash, as you all know, is a byproduct of the thermal plants, and GGBS is a uh, byproduct of cast iron or iron industry. Then uh, instead of using um, plywoods <coughs> or virgin wood, they had used bagasse board, which is a byproduct of sugarcane industry instead of plyboards of interiors, partitions, and, and uh, usage of uh, paints, which had very low uh, impact on the environment. And uh, the construction was kept low so that the vegetation could buffer the building to a very large extent. And uh, pass, uh, they had used two passive cooling, uh, sorry, they had used two wind towers, you can see it in the picture, in order to modulate uh, or rather channelize the wind from the windward side to the leeward side and used it as an advantage for the air circulation, thereby bringing, in, bringing down the load of uh, air conditioning. Uh, energy in terms of just blowing the air was reduced to a very large extent. And uh, uh, the uh, SPAC system which they had used is which is uh, very, very efficient uh, because the air supply to the HVAC systems and the AHUs are already a lesser by eight degrees, and uh, this reduced the uh, load on the air cooling systems. Then uh, you can see the uh, roofs. Uh, the roofs, yeah, as you can see here, uh, you can see the roofs. Uh, were very thick. So it did not permit uh, uh, heat transmission during the day. And uh, mm, the concrete blocks which were used for facades uh, had, were aerated or it had air cavities inside. Thereby it reduced the amount of heat which was transferred into the buildings. And together because of these two design features, the load of the air conditioning was brought down to by 20%. Then uh, all the spaces uh, ensures uh, daylight access and use by uh, 90 percent. And north facades were only only the north facades were glazed for efficient uh, uh, diffuse light. And uh, low heat and the, here also you, they used low heat transmitting glasses and uh, double glasses in order to reduce the heat gain. Natural lighting was another feature. If you look at the roof. 90% uh, of the roof is 65%. Uh, sorry, 60% of the roof is either covered with is covered with vegetation. You can see it here, and the rest of the uh, area was covered with uh, photovoltaic panels, uh, which harness energy uh, for the running of for the operation of the building. Then uh, these two features uh, together increase the lifespan of the roof and uh, reduce the heat island effect. 
the double glazed units uh, units for fenestration use uh, wherever they had any fenestration using glass they had filled it up with arg argon gas in order to improve the quality of the glass and not permit any uh, radiation to enter into the building and uh, <clears throat> instead of windows these kind of jolly formations were used on the especially on the facade as a second skin and also on various parts of the courtyard in order to permit diffuse lighting into major of the areas all the rainwater which was falling on the ground was collected and uh, wastewater and rainwater runoff is 100% recycled and directed to one of the three ponds out of which one of the ponds collects the wastewater from the sewage and after a kind of uh, uh, getting it treated through road zoning uh, root zone method uh, uses it for again re re uh, flushing of the toilets and other things thereby in totality they have reduced the amount of water which they take from the municipality by 35 percent then uh, they were very particular that any wood which is going to be used here if it has to be harvested uh, they ensure that the re, the uh, wood is uh, uh, harvested sustainably in the sense that uh, new trees are planted and 96% uh, of the construction waste, you can see the tiles and uh, other uh, landscape features here, they were all made from the construction waste in the uh, site. Then uh, pathways leading in landscape are stone or tiles which were leftover materials in construction and energy efficient lighting system and compact fluorescent light lamps were used. So what we understand from this is that uh, we have to have these two principal forces when we are looking towards the future for the build building industry. One is environmental conservation that is used as less as uh, you harm the environment to the very uh, minimum possible by way of design, by way of procurement of materials and uh, also be thinking about construction processes where post the building, the building, building has finished its use, how it gets dismantled and uh, demolished. So <clears throat> then, uh, and we use technological innovations like uh, your building, um, building management systems uh, and various other technological innovations in order to see that the buildings becomes dynamic and comfortable. Uh, and uh, environmental conservation compels all uh, types of developments and human activities to be environmentally responsible. This is true not only for uh, buildings, but also for all kinds of business uh, in today's life uh, for manufacturing, transport, agriculture, and also architecture. It becomes very necessary that we are environmentally conscious. And uh, the important shop, uh, factors for shaping a new paradigm of practice of building industries in all nations to the world, whether it is developing or developed. Never look at uh, the, uh, never take uh, the developed countries uh, model as the best because uh, they are now cleaning up whatever mess they have created in the past few decades. So developing countries can look at their own traditions, their own values and their own uh, materials and create a uh, design palette which will be suitable for our particular location. And uh, technological innovation, again, you can see the, <coughs> Uh, energy conserve, consumption, conserving on energy consumption, technology which conserves energy consumption, like um, what we saw in the case study, harnessing energy from alternative sources, uh, be it uh, especially the renewable sources like uh, solar, wind, geothermal, uh, tide, or whatever kind of alternative sources, there are, uh, there is a huge uh, uh, amount of research which hope happens uh, in that in those particular fields, and uh, it becomes very necessary for the um, designers and uh, people who are engaged in the building industry to look at uh, where you are going to harness your energy from and utilize it accordingly. And uh, uh, there is also a lot of understanding because of uh, the uh, health, consciousness of health in the increase in the consciousness of the health in the past uh, one, one half decades. Uh, what goes as painting and uh, how is the indoor air quality? Uh, it takes a lot of uh, uh, I mean, receives a lot of attention and uh, response from the built industry. And see to it that you do not cause much of environmental pollution. And uh, this opens up a uh, possibility of automated buildings, which again is becomes technologically intensive or rather energy intensive. But we'll have to see how to trade off between these two. 
and the important ramification to design of new built environments. What, how does a built environment, uh, how does it affect the environment and ecology? We have to be totally conscious. So you will find that the more technological innovation will cause more uh, utilization of uh, uh, resources. More technological innovation will cause more uh, energy intensive applications, but you will have to see how to create a middle path. Uh, this also cause, uh, calls in for a lot of responsible actions from the, uh, from the citizens as well as the designers in how, uh, how much you have to be consumeristic in, in your approach to life and building. Uh, if you look at any building, uh, if you look at any building, you will find that uh, there is a lot of resources which enter the building, whether it be building materials, whether it is energy, whether it is water, whether it is consumable goods or solar radiation or wind and rain, they all enter the building. Their, uh, uh, their quality is much different from what flows out of the building. Here, we, uh, it is our, the designer's uh, responsibility to see that these elements harm the environment the minimum or rather the impact of all these elements like used materials. Once the building material uh, comes, uh, building materials is put into a building and post uh, building, when the building is going to be demolished, uh, are you designing in such a manner that you can dismantle the building? I will give you an example. We used to build, uh, we used to have cement, lime mortar as our uh, bonding material till a few, uh, say, few decades back. You can stay in some buildings is still used. So what happens is when you are knocking the building down, it becomes easily, uh, it becomes possible for you to easily uh, take out the building blocks or the bricks or the laterite blocks if you are bonding it with uh, lime mortar. Whereas if you are using uh, cement mortar, um, you will find that uh, uh, you it's simply not possible to get one laterite as a block. You'll have to knock it and it breaks into pieces. Only material, only uh, application you can see do is use it in other construction as materials or use it as other aggregates uh, or use it as suki. So if you if you if you develop a research where you can um, you can integrate like the Lego blocks, you can integrate your uh, because lime is not so easily available and your intensity of uh, building is so high that even if it is available, it cannot be reached anywhere, everywhere. So you look at building materials where we can lock itself, interlock itself together so that when you have to demolish it, you can dismantle it and you hardly have any waste. So similarly, you'll find uh, uh, you use uh, uh, thermal energy, you will have uh, combustion by products, whereas if you use uh, solar energy, Apart from uh, uh, maybe once in two decades, you have to uh, you have to replace your solar panels. You will have you will not have any combustion byproducts, and definitely that will not be a combustion byproduct. You have rainwater entering into the building or a portable water entering into the building. You see to it that you uh, utilize it to the maximum so that it sinks into the soil some there itself, or the water which is coming out. Uh, is polluting by quantity and quality is not polluting. What we usually do is we mix the sewage and sludge and then uh, create so much of sewage, uh, cre create so much of grey water that becomes difficult to uh, do any kind of uh, treatment on that. Whereas if you divide, I mean, if you subdivide or, or uh, if you separate your uh, sludge and sewage, it's much easier to It is much easier to uh, treat your uh, sludge and uh, use it again for uh, maybe uh, flushing of toilets or gardening or various other means. Same is the situation with uh, consumer goods. Solar radiation, uh, I think I already told, when the sun's uh, radiation enters through a habitable space, it comes as a long wave radiation. At the moment it leaves the, after reflection on various surfaces, it is <coughs> short wave radiation. So we we'll have to look at uh, the use of glass as a building material very critically, and the consumer goods, uh, the consumerism where you sort of uh, replace the, all the consumable goods which you are doing, uh, I mean, which you have in your houses every five years or ten years, you all ends up as in the landfill as uh, made, uh, as uh, waste. Uh, how do you create recyclable materials, and how to use these consumer goods in a very responsible manner? And uh, wind which enters again becomes polluted air. So we have these three phases in 
three phases in uh, building the pre building uh, phenomena building and the post building uh, pre building is uh, before construction uh, where uh, all the materials are, be are being manufactured mined extracted uh, i think the sequence went wrong extracted mined and extracted and manufactured and uh, then you have the building phase where you design the building and uh, you also um, put all these elements together in order to create minimum damage to the environment and the post building as I explained now after the building use uh, useful life building completes its useful life either socially or physically or economically you how to use the building in newer ways you can even use the building as it is as in a adaptive uh, manner for another use uh, or you can see to it that when it, if at all it has to be dismantled it has to be dismantled in such a way, uh, fashion that you create minimum amount of waste which will go into the landfill then uh, this is how the site will respond um, in uh, before construction this is how the building will respond uh, to all these elements uh, before and after construction so these are the strategies input reduction methods reduce the flow of non renewable resources into the building you limit the amount of resources which go into the building it related its efficiency in utilizing resources you consider a building uh, like uh, the cii so uh, sobrat center was considered as uh, success because the way it had um, way it had responded uh, to the climate and the loca location and the way it had utilized the various amount of materials and then uh, output management methods uh, you should see to it that it causes minimum um, pollution to the environment and uh, low level of waste and proper waste management so this is the if you look at these three phases in detail uh, the pre phase pre building phase uh, has got the manufacture extraction uh, processing packaging and shipping uh, this is before we as uh, we as uh, designers and uh, people who are in the building industry uh, i'm not talking about consumerist uh, people who are engaged in the building industry even start designing these things are already done and it is available because uh, uh, they know that they have the buyers so we have to be very uh, choosy in how to choose these elements you will have to see how uh, pre building phases uh if this is this is the one which causes mass maximum environmental damage because you are extracting materials from raw materials uh, it, even if it is material is having renewable sources if the intensity of extraction is more than what has been uh, replenished you will find that uh, you have a reduction in the amount of raw materials and uh, most of these raw materials are finite uh, it has got a limit of how much it can be uh, utilized so you will find <coughs> you will find uh, that uh, you have to be very 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 conscious while choosing the kind of materials you use i'll give an example you have a material which is uh, pro uh, going through proper environmental procedures but which costs 1.2 times than the normal material which uses lower uh, kind of uh, production methods in terms of production uh, so what happens is we will definitely looking at the economy we will go and purchase the one which is costing less but uh, today with a lot of information on uh, uh, the kind of manufacturing process in most of these uh, industries adopt uh, you will have to choose materials which where the manufacturing process harms the environment in a very minimum fashion and uh, this is the phase where uh, as uh, architects uh, as uh, civil engineers as people who are associated with the building industry have got maximum to contribute you choose your materials you choose uh, what kind of what kind of uh, how it comes together in a, in a building and what kind of operation and maintenance uh, you create and uh, what kind of in internal air quality you are going to provide for the habitat uh, habitants and uh, how how long how durable can your building be so all this can be used by uh, can be decided by the designer and uh, the post building phase how do you recycle and reuse the building see to it that uh, there is some possibility of an adaptive reuse and uh, which we will see in the coming years because uh, with the current pandemic and uh, the most of these information technology uh, technology uh, 
industry is looking at uh, why they should be spending so much on building and uh, why this uh, work at home cannot be made a, a little more uh, uh, lengthier thereby they are um, the sort of uh, saving a lot of money in terms of their uh, their uh, infrastructure maintenance so what will happen to all these kind of uh, information centers which has been built across uh, the nation uh, especially in uh, cities like bangalore chennai trivandrum kochi and so on so we will have to look at the, what the building will be put to use like uh, we have uh, very beautiful examples like uh, and there are uh, even buildings which uh, there is a thai factory which has become a kalyana mandapam so the pe people's imaginations are really high so how whether your building becomes adaptable for any kind of uh, new use after the um, current use is uh, lost out because of socio economic uh, situ or cultural situations uh, is something which we will have to always uh, take into account and uh, Uh, we will see features of uh, sustainable building materials, uh, pollution prevention measures in manufacturing, and waste reduction measures in manufacturing. That is, uh, you please read the catalog of all the building materials which you are going to put into use in your building, and uh, uh, so that uh, you know which manufacturer is going uh, is causing maximum damage to the environment and ecology, and uh, what is the possibility of uh, recycling this particular content. And uh, how uh, they have reduced the embodied energy reduction. Uh, this again uh, has got a lot of uh, uh, lot of uh, inputs from where you are going to source your uh, uh, materials. In the sense that uh, you can have marble, which is uh, uh, you can have a stone, which is uh, sourced from uh, the locality. You can have uh, kadapa and kota stones, which are sourced from Andhra Pradesh, and you can have. Uh, uh, and you can have uh, uh, marble and uh, uh, sandstone source from Rajasthan, or you can have the Italian marble source from Italy. So it all depends on how much you are going to spend on transportation and uh, how much uh, energy is going to be spent in uh, transporting these materials from the uh, from the mining area to your location. So and uh, use of natural materials. Definitely, you will find that uh, natural materials have less embodied energy than any manufactured element. Uh, whether we call it, uh, unless you call, use uh, materials like uh, what we saw in uh, uh, CAA, you had the bagasse board and those kind of research which go into how materials. One material which has come um, back in with great force is uh, bamboo. Uh, the three materials which are very natural and which can be again and again uh, renewed uh, uh, based on proper planning is uh, one is lime, the other one is uh, wood, and the third one is uh, bamboo. Uh, we will find that uh, if we plan, uh, these materials can exist as long as we want to build if you uh, do not extract it beyond its uh, supplementation. And then uh, how to reduce construction waste and uh, local materials. Uh, these are all your pre-building uh, measures, pre-building measures. And uh, you, when, when you are operating, when you are building and operating the building, what kind of, uh, how do you achieve the energy efficiency and uh, water treatment and conservation? Whether you are using non-toxic materials so that your indoor air quality remains uh, uh, good uh, or uh, within uh, the limits. And uh, the how do you harness the renewable energy sources and from what locality to what locality location you are going to transmit it? And uh, how, how, how durable is your material, the longer life of the material? These are your building phase. And post building, you'll have to review the entire uh, procedure in terms of whether the materials which you have chosen has become biodegradable and recyclable, and uh, how reusable are they? The three process of uh, recycle, re reduce, recycle, and reuse, and others. So, you for this uh, one. Uh, we cannot say it's a new uh, concept. One uh, concept which has emerged in the past two decades is the life cycle design. That is, you look at a building, you look at a material, you look at a building uh, for its entire life. That is, starting from its uh, uh, manufacturing stage to its uh, uh, to, to its waste stage. How how are you going to um, how are you going to handle it? Uh, the conventional model of the building life cycle is as shown here. You have the design phase, you have the construction phase, the operation and maintenance phase. The building loses its value 
uh, due to various reasons is demolished and it goes into waste. So this is what we were uh, looking at as buildings, but uh, now we look at building as a cycle, the, the entire building life cycle process of a building as a cyclic process. You have the pre-building phase where you are extracting uh, material from the nature uh, and then uh, you are processing, manufacturing and transporting it to your construction site. And uh, then uh, you run the building in uh, or you operate and maintain the building during its uh, life. And then once the building becomes uh, uh, obsolete due to various reasons, you, it's either reused as it is or its parts are used. And uh, if it cannot be reused, if it is recycled or upscaled, and uh, what kind of, uh, when you are recycling, you are again seeing to it that it goes into one of the manufacturing processes. And then the waste, <coughs> waste management happens. And then you go into a post building phase. I mean, sorry, this is the post building phase. And then the waste goes back into, see to it that the waste goes back into nature and not into uh, landfills, which have become such <coughs> blotches in nature. So is it possible for us to be responsible uh, while we are uh, uh, building? Well, when we take a building and um, building of uh, whether it is a single uh, habitable house or whether it is huge infrastructure, you will find that uh, uh, this is uh, these are two graphs which clearly explain that uh, how certain countries have become uh, uh, have have been very very responsible in their uh, uh, consumption and how some countries have been very irresponsible in their consumption. So the first figure shows a correlation between per capita income and the per capita energy consumption of, select, of selected countries. And you can see that uh, uh, as your per capita income goes from uh, $10,000 per year to $40,000 per year, uh, USA is uh, uh, consuming the, uh, or rather emitting the maximum amount of carbon into the environment. And uh, uh, <coughs> Countries like Japan, Austria, some of the Scandinavian countries like Netherlands uh, are all, even though their their uh, per capita income is much more than uh, the per capita income of uh, Australia and uh, Canada and the uh, USA, their, uh, their emissions are much lower. Uh, and if you go by uh, per energy consumption, again, you will find that uh, uh, this is the energy production peninsula. Uh, and uh, some of these energy productions are very high for countries like Venezuela, which is again is a developing country. Whereas uh, your uh, per capita domestic product of production of energy, as is it goes higher, how it keeps on increasing. And uh, is it possible for a society to establish resource efficient social and economic infrastructures? Yes, these are examples which we can follow. The examples are from uh, Japan, uh, Sweden, Denmark, and all this, which have kept their energy production low in spite of high uh, income. And a society, whether it is a household or a community, city or a country, with an inf infrastructure will be less susceptible. These countries which are following these paths will be less susceptible to resource shortages, more reliable by itself, and more sustainable in the future. So coming to sustainable choices, it, it is always easy to advocate, but it's very difficult to follow. So uh, this is uh, the sustainable choices, uh, both in buildings and in lifestyle. Uh, like uh, when uh, this FDP was planned and I was invited to attend. Uh, and uh, we also have, uh, on the last day, we have Professor Satya Pragash, who is uh, coming to uh, deliver, or rather have a dialogue with all of you with regard to sustainability and sustainable choices. Uh, we had a discussion and we felt that uh, there are so many FDPs, so many programs, so many events uh, uh, which, which discuss all these things. But how do you practice it into your lifestyle? How, do, how to see to it that uh, as an individual, whether you are contributing to uh, the um, carbon emissions, you are contributing to uh, various uh, uh, various negative impacts on environment by way of your lifestyle. In your in this consumeristic society where we do not have any problems exchanging our mobiles or a laptop in a decade, uh, whether uh, we are changing our cars every five years, uh, what is it that we are doing to environment? So these are the sustainable choices we have.
you have uh, you practice minimalism whether it is uh, buildings or lifestyle whether it is building or lifestyle uh, you practice minimalism you consume only the only you build only what is very much necessary whether it is your own house how much square feet you are building again this point uh, comes again in your buy right size house or build right size house Uh, you build only whatever is necessary in terms of uh, house because uh, uh, we cannot uh, like just because uh, uh, just because we have the money we we should not be building what is not necessary for us because uh, you have to understand that you 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 are continuously spending on energy and resources in maintaining and uh, operating the building and uh, whether in lifestyle whether you you require uh, uh, 20 sets of dress or you require uh, 100 sets of dress is something which you can choose whether you need to go to uh, for a holiday uh, taking an air travel every year or uh, once in 10 years uh, uh, or whether you go to the local uh, whether you go to the local uh, uh, scenic area and have the same kind of recreation these are things which we will have to uh, bring into your lifestyle and reduce reuse and recycle again i have purposely placed them both in buildings and uh, lifestyle you build uh, uh, you build the amount of waste which you are creating you build uh, reduce the amount of uh, you reduce the amount of uh, waste you are creating both in buildings and lifestyle you uh, reduce the amount of products which you purchase uh, and then waste or purchase and consume and uh, you if possible anything which is available like reuse your uh, tissue paper and uh, which is made out of uh, 100% uh, bleached uh, whether you are going you are never going to reuse it uh, use a towel you can reuse it again and again so whether you are going to uh, whether you are going to reuse material or uh, use materials which can be reused and how much of it can be recycled and then uh, uh, again in lifestyle this is the i mean the example of towel and again here we can see that uh, when we are using a building material like uh, hardwood is it possible to reduce uh, the usage of uh, hardwood and if you are going to reduce it um, i mean use it then how do you reuse it even if you are demolishing a building can you scavenge all these elements like steel uh, aluminum and timber uh, even uh, tiles to a glass which can be used again in the ceramic industry uh, so whether it is possible to reuse and then how much of it ha- can be recycled or upsc- upcycled and then uh, skip single use items items which can be used only once uh, please uh, skip them both in the buildings and also in the lifestyle and then uh, have tree free home that is elements or uh, um, products which you are using both in house and buildings see to it that they are not directly i mean directly resourced from trees so and use techno sustainable technologies whether it is going to be your uh, uh, air conditioner whether it is going to be the refrigerator you are using whether it is going to be uh, a cheap product which you use for a very short while because you can uh, replace it within the next 3 uh, uh, to 5 years uh, you love to look at uh, the technology which which is appropriate for the not only for your pa- pocket but also for the uh, mother earth then uh, buy products which is uh, less packaging this is very very uh, relevant in today's uh, times uh, you buy materials uh, imagine you are tra- going to transport some uh, uh, high grade glass from switzerland or uh, sweden uh, because it has got lot of thermal properties and in the process you end up having it so much packaged uh, that uh, you the entire packaging becomes an environmental burden Uh, and then uh, this is very true uh, in lifestyle because we seem to be purchasing left right and uh, center uh, from various uh, on site uh, uh, on site uh, retail uh, centers and they come with such heavy packing like uh, uh, heavy packing that you do not know if you are living in a house you do not know you cannot throw it on the uh, street because uh, now in kerala it's very conscious of uh, what uh, what is thrown into the street if you are in an apartment uh, you will have to pay for somebody to pick it up and go and even if they are going to pick it up and go i don't think it goes in back into the manufacturing process it ends up in the landfill then 
you you can remodel some build, you can remodel the building which you are residing itself in, into uh, a green building choices by adopting many of the uh, strategies which we discussed and uh, uh, in lifestyle you can uh, be more efficient with your errands that is you 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 plan your uh, outings you plan your transportation requirements uh, to see to it that uh, uh, the number of errands you are running is lesser uh, then use daylight as much as possible wherever possible use daylight and uh, prevent uh, usage of artificial lighting and uh, as discussed uh, buy only the house or build only the house which is uh, required for you uh, there is this beautiful concept uh, by japanese called metabolism where uh, they construct the house <coughs> They construct the house as the family is growing and they are able to detach parts of it when the uh, family becomes shrinks. That is, uh, you have a family, two people start living together and they have children and the uh, space requirements become more. And over a period of time, children get married, they go for higher studies, they find uh, occupation elsewhere. You, the space requirement becomes less. So these parts of the houses can be dismantled and taken away. So this has even been done in... Uh, <coughs> high-rise buildings and even in, it is usually practiced in Japan. So this is called the metabolism way of building and uh, practice zero energy balance budget. <coughs> it's better to start a journal and write down wherever, wherever you are going to use your energy and how you can harness it so that over a period of time you can be, uh, your, your residence can be or your building where you are residing can um, start off giving back into the grid. Then the uh, Change the lights in your house from uh, uh, something which is absorbing more energy into more uh, energy conscious elements like uh, uh, LEDs, CFTs, and so on. Uh, I know there are certain uh, uh, there are certain arguments against even CFTs because of the amount of mercury which is given, which is used. But uh, that 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 again will show uh, new challenges in how we are going to recycle that particular waste, or whether that mercury itself can be. Uh, extracted from these uh, bulbs. The problem is we do not segregate our waste and throw everything together, thereby making it difficult to segregate and extract things from our waste. Then unplug devices when not in use. That is uh, something which all of us can practice. Uh, so we definitely do not, uh, whether it is computers or whether it is washing machine or whether it is mobile, uh, we just uh, take our devices and go away, never uh, switch off the device, thereby creating a lot of energy uh, wastages and uh, indirectly also affecting your uh, uh, economy by increased uh, electricity bills. And uh, wherever possible, choose uh, renewable energy. And uh, in lifestyle, apart from the ones which I've already seen, uh, become more efficient with your errands. Start using natural cleaners. Uh, the source from where, uh, uh, where I read this says that uh, earlier we used to have such biodegradable elements for our cleaning. We used to have uh, uh, coir, we used to have uh, coconut uh, peat, you used to have the coconut, the peel of the coconut itself uh, used as a natural cleaner. Now we do not see any of them because of various reasons. Uh, and you will find that uh, the, the alternative which we have got for all these cleaners are heavily uh, endowed with uh, elements which are either containing plastics or micro elements uh, which go and clog all the porous uh, uh, parts of the earth and uh, prevent the percolation of water into the uh, soil. So spend more time reading and playing games. Uh, the idea is you become more knowledgeable and you spend more time with the family. But at the same time, you also see to it that you do not use any of the energy resources when you are doing this. Then uh, try to get uh, more uh, natural sleep schedule. The idea is that you work during the day and uh, sleep during the night. Uh, whereas today's uh, generation, all of us, when we were young, we used to do this. Uh, so let's not be critical on the youth. Uh, what we do is we turn the, burn the midnight oil to do our work. And what happens is that we disrupt our biological cycle and uh, which affects our health. Apart from that, we see to that we use more of light. If we work during the day, you will find that your lighting requirements, artificial lighting requirements are kept to the minimum. Walk, bike, or carpool to work. Uh, this is something which uh, uh, which has been again and again uh, uh, reinforced. Uh, walk, and this also uh, depends on what kind of public transportation systems you have. 
uh, which is again becomes uh, uh, the responsibility of the government to provide uh, walk bike. This is something which the Scandinavian countries and some parts of uh, some states in U United States are doing very well. Uh, and then uh, you carpool to work rather than uh, going in individual cars to from one origin to the same destination. See to it that many people travel uh, travel together. There are certain cities where they find uh, uh, drive. I mean, find the uh, find the uh, driver if he is traveling alone. Uh, you are supposed to travel with minimum of uh, two or four uh, people. So, uh, and uh, there was a very heartening news uh, two days back when uh, one of the countries in the Latin America made the public transport free, so that uh, people choose to travel in public transport rather than using their private vehicles. Then changing changing washing habits, we seem to be uh, so much carried away with uh, cleanliness, especially in this uh, COVID time. We seem to be washing our hands again and again to the extent we create a, a lot of blisters and aches on our skin. So this is required in the current pandemic, but uh, see to it that you're washing habits, whether it is uh, how many times you wash uh, uh, your clothes, how many times you wash your house, or how many times you wash your clean your house, and how many times you wash your car. Uh, does not cause uh, much stress on the resource in terms of water and usage of a uh, lot of liquid soaps, which again, as I was telling you, will clog the uh, Mother Earth. Become a member of a community garden, cult start cultivating something so that you do not lose the connection with the soil and uh, stop unwanted mail. Uh, write to people who are sending you still printed material uh, to stop it and receive it in terms of uh, uh, mail uh, communication and uh, wherever you are using plastic whether it is uh, plastic in terms of carry bags uh, or shopping bags uh, or whether you are using plastic for various uh, materials uh, see to it that uh, you stop using them and uh, carry your own reusable or shopping bags uh, which has become necessary because uh, government has uh, stipulated that whether a, a shop likes it or not they love to charge people for shopping bags so there was uh, and uh, it is much more, uh, uh, much more, what's say, individualistic to carry your own shopping bags than carry the shopping bags which the shop provide you pr printed with their logos and other things. You do not become a walking advertisement for them. Then observe an eco sabbath uh, on a particular day uh, during particular time. See to it that you do not use any energy. So if you do this on an everyday basis, you will find that you end up saving almost 20, 15 to 20 percent of energy uh, in a in a month. And in a year, so month and a year. So you will find that this contributes to a very large extent. And what will happen is you will also uh, end up with hobbies which are less energy conscious and much better in terms of health style. Uh, stop using, reduce uh, disposable materials, whether it is uh, tissue paper, whether it is uh, disposable pens, whether it is any kind of disposable plates, cutlery, whatever which we are using as disposable. And wherever possible, share with friends or borrow. If you have a book, you have like, this is very common within the Indian community abroad. Somehow in India, we have a lot of uh, status associated. We, have, we are too egoistic to even uh, give something or uh, to, of which we have used. Imagine your child has a tricycle and somebody else has, uh, there is a child of, who requires a tricycle. You have a reluctance to give it to them and they have a reluctance to take it from you. The most you can do it is give it to the people who are helping you, your domestic helps or drivers or something like that. You will never give it to. Whereas if you look at the Indian community abroad, I know only about the Indian community, they have this uh, uh, habit of sharing. And finally, be very conscious of what you are eating as your food. Uh, I mean, uh, don't think that uh, uh, I'm being very, very what to say, narrow-minded, but uh, meat, meat itself is a huge uh, uh, energy uh, intensive uh, food whereas if you in terms of how, how much of water how much of uh, even uh, storage how much of uh, production uh, whereas your vegetables and your vegan food style has uh, much much more uh, softer on mother earth so these are the sustainable choices i was very particular that i will uh, put this particular slide even though it doesn't talk much about buildings uh, because this is where as an individual you can make a uh, difference in the uh, lifestyle. So it is one ten. I have finished on time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Now it's the time for Q and A. 
So the participants can pose the questions in the chat box. Ma'am, uh, I would like to ask a question. Yes, yes. Yeah. Ma'am, I stay in Palkar where we know that the climatic variation is very high because it, if it's hot, it's very hot and if it's cold, it's very cold. So uh, from an architectural point of view, uh, can we adopt any methodology on the existing buildings I'm talking to maintain this climatic variation in an optimal range? Is there any methodology that we can adopt? Yes. Uh, are you living in a detached house or uh, in one of the townhouses in Palakkad? One of the townhouses in Palakkad. Townhouses. So yeah. definitely you can uh, see uh, because uh, these houses also have uh, uh, these houses also have become uh, have gone undergone lot of changes in terms of uh, uh, what is what are the adjoining kind of uh, uh, activities and uh, uses. Uh, and uh, uh, typologies, it is varying. Some of the townhouses, uh, you will find that the entire uh, street or entire locality has uh, some uh, has some conservation principles where they have maintained the uh, maintained the agraharams uh, as it is. But uh, you will find uh, many of them have undergone changes, which makes it. Uh, as a reaction, like you have a commercial development next to your house, naturally your habitation will undergo some changes. So these possible, poss po I mean, these uh, these factors have developed. But you will find uh, you can uh, uh, there are a lot of technologies which are there. You can uh, you can see to it that uh, these townhouses have a very very effective uh, courtyard system, evaporative cooling methods. See to it that your uh, uh, evaporating cooling is on. That is, uh, just because these methods, uh, uh, you have a change of activity around, you don't go and uh, cover up your uh, courtyard. Even if you are covering up your courtyard, see to it that the airflow is not uh, stopped. Mm, so that is uh, that is the major mistake which is happening in most of the townhouses in uh, townhouses because you are blocking the courtyard because your neighboring activities have changed and you are responding to that. Uh, if you are studying, staying in individual uh, independent houses, definitely you can uh, vary. Like uh, you are uh, um, earlier, we used to have mass trom. I mean, madras terrace, which is again a trom wall in the sense that uh, you had a very thick wall which uh, uh, prevented heat from first radiating inside. Even if it radiated inside, it was uh, because of the fenestrations. It used to be let out through the courtyards. So over a period of time, we have moved from trombo walls to concrete. So if you are moving to concrete, you will have to see how you can create additional thicknesses. It can be by a green cover. It can be by uh, additional application of uh, weathering courses or so on, so that you do not permit uh, uh, solar radiation to penetrate into the habitable spaces directly. Then uh, the Kerala typology of houses definitely had a huge attic space or an air cavity which is to buffer uh, uh, solar radiation from penetrating. Again, if you are moving out from uh, the even the tile houses and the air cavity construction, see to it that you create some kind of a ceiling and an outlet in order to uh, suck up, evacuate the hot air which gets uh, accumulated over at very close to the roof. Uh, so these are the broad things which I can tell, and uh, you can uh, uh, you can sort of uh, look at uh, it case by case. How do you? And now there is a lot of uh, um, lot of uh, double skin uh, facades. That is uh, facades which have very thin and which are absorbing lot of uh, radiation. How to make it into a uh, also add on one more skin with an air cavity in between so that you can. Uh, prevent thermal radiation from penetrating into buildings. So there are possibilities, are, there are various choices. You have to see what is suitable and uh, apt for your location and your residence, whether how much of, uh, how much of uh, vegetation you have around, what kind of activities are happening around. With all this, I'm sure that you will be able to make significant reduction, at least five to six degrees variation between the external temperature and the internal temperature. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. That was a detailed answer. Now, uh, I would like to invite Ms. Vidya Kanagaraj to deliver the word of thanks. Okay. Thank you, Harita. 
I wanted to express my paramount gratitude to Dr. Prasanna for delivering a session on architecture, strategies to mitigate climate change. It is thoroughly enlightening and informative session for the participants. I personally liked how Prasanna Ma'am highlighted the design of buildings with inclusion of microclimate. It is really intelligent and thankful. Also, the way Ma'am mentioned the case study of the LEED certified building outside USA. And finally, Ma'am led us to minimalism. Ma'am also added the importance of reuse and recycle of materials. And the way Madam explained the topic was exemplary. So thank you, Ma'am, once again for sharing your valuable time with us. Thank you, Vidya. Mm, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, the entire Department of uh, Civil Engineering and uh, HOD, uh, Dr. Shah, uh, for having me for this session. And uh, uh, I, I, I really enjoyed uh, preparing for it and presenting it. Uh, I hope yeah. uh, all of us uh, make a little change in our lifestyles. Uh, I mean, even the minimum changes, like uh, not using disposable elements, even if we do not intervene in the building, at individual level, we make our uh, uh, choices, the right choices in order to see to it that uh, we harm the environment uh, the very minimum and uh, do not contribute to the consumeristic society, which we are all part of. Some of them are unavoidable, but many of them can be avoided. Thanks, thank you all. Thank you all the participants for your patient hearing. Uh, I hope you had something to take away. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So I request the participants to please fill the feedback form. The link of the same is shared in the chat box. That's the end of today's session. Hope all the participants have filled the feedback form. Join back at 2 p.m. today for today's final section. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.
good afternoon all welcome back to the program let's move on to the final session of the day ms vidya kankaraj will introduce the resource person ma'am please okay thank you gayatri so our speaker of this session is architect indu v of kerala Disa state Disaster Management Authority, KSDMA, Government of Kerala, India. I was working with Rebuild Kerala Initiative Project. Also worked as state level shelter coordinator at United Nations Development Program, Flood Recovery Project Management Unit, Kerala. She was an architect at Habitat Technology Group, Tiruvannathapuram, Kerala. Mam is well experienced in cost effective, environment friendly and resilient construction practices. Ma'am, now you may start the session. Uh, am I audible? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. You are. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank the Department of Civil Engineering in ESCE for inviting me uh, to this faculty development program. Uh, my topic for the day is disaster management in Kerala and overview. Uh, I'm afraid it's it's a bit dry because uh, it deals mostly with the legal framework and institutional mechanism of disaster management in the state. In the state. So please bear with me. Uh, let me share the uh, screen. Is the screen visible to you all? Ah, yes, ma'am, it is. Okay, so today uh, I'll be sharing with you uh, a brief outline about how disaster management works in the state. Uh, ma'am, you can put in slideshow. Uh, I have put it in full screen. Okay. Is it visible? Ah, yes, it's visible, but not in slideshow, that's all. It's visible. Oh, but I, in my computer, I can see it in full screen. Okay. And okay, ma'am, continue. Okay. Um, so through this presentation, I intend to brief you on the following topics. There's the basic terminology used in disaster management. Uh, how disaster management evolved in India, the Disaster Management Act 2005, the institutional mechanism of disaster management both at national level and state level, how disaster management happens in Kerala, a little bit about Kerala State Disaster Management Authority, uh, how disaster management happens in, in the districts, and local self-government disaster management plans, and other mechanisms. Uh, we will begin with the basic terminology. Uh, some of you, or many of you might be familiar with these terms. However, just to have everybody on the same page, let me introduce these terms. First, we'll see what hazard is. Uh, can someone please tell me what hazard is? Are the participants allowed to unmute their mics? Yes, ma'am. If someone can tell me what the word hazard means to you. A danger or risk. Okay. You have used two words, a danger or risk. We'll see what these two words mean. Anybody else? Something unwanted. Something unwanted. Okay. Uh, a hazard could be defined as a process, phenomenon, or human activity that may cause loss of life, injury, or other health impacts, property damage, social and economic destruction, or environmental degradation. So, simply put, anything that can that has the potential to cause damage can be called a hazard. Uh, so, you can see a few pictures here, uh, floods, land, hello, 
hello ma'am your slide is not changing actually this is the first slide it is visible there oh um um uh, should i share the ppt with you so that you can change the slides from there a uh, non uh, i think you can uh, share your end screen and the screen share button okay i think you are uh, sharing already that particular tab yeah i was sharing the window once again this slide share is it visible now yeah it's visible the slide is hazard yeah uh, let me put it on screen. full screen oh, yeah is it okay now can you see the slide hazard yes yeah, slide is shown but it is not full screen you can the picture um i don't know why it's happening earlier it was working fine i had a meeting a few minutes ago and i was able to share it in full screen so just move on to the next slide please whether it is changing or not you can check it now i've changed the slide but still it is hazard slide oh okay and now hazard type slide Okay. But do you see it in full screen? No, not full screen, but it is visible. Yeah. So I'll increase the size. Yeah, yeah. That is the size in it. Okay, fine, ma'am. So it can be it can be zoom by individuals. That is okay, fine. Okay. 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 So as I said earlier, uh, anything which has the potential to cause damage can be called a hazard. Yeah, the important thing to uh, keep in mind is a hazard need not necessarily uh, cause loss of life or an injury or any other damage. It only has the potential to cause damage. Please keep that in mind. Now we'll go to the different types of hazards. Uh, everybody will be familiar uh, with uh, the different types of hazards. The most common classification is natural and man made or you can also call it anthropogenic or human induced so within uh, the category of natural hazards you have it can be further further classified into geophysical hazards such as earthquake uh, volcanic eruption tsunami etc then you have hydrological hazards such as flood landslide wave action etc uh, then there are meteorological hazards such as cyclone storm surge heat wave uh, frost lightning uh, snow storm etc then there are climatological hazards such as drought uh, glacial lake outburst flood subsidence etc and finally we have biological hazards such as epidemics insect infestation etc so the covid-19 pandemic can be grouped under the biological hazard Uh, examples for anthropogenic or human induced hazard include accidents pollution terrorist activities etc let's go to the next term that is exposure uh, exposure is uh, is a situation of people infrastructure housing production capacities and other tangible human assets located in the hazard hazard prone areas so what are the things that are getting exposed to a particular hazard that is uh, meant by exposure so if we consider a particular hazard to occur uh, it could be the people in that area it could be the infrastructure networks like 
power network, electricity, com communication systems, transport systems, industries, and all, all these sorts of things can get affected by a hazard. And all these constitute the exposure to a particular hazard. Next, next term is vulnerability. Vulnerability is the condition of the exposed assets. So uh, in the previous slide, we saw that what are the things that are getting exposed. Now, the condition of those things are uh, determine the vulnerability of that particular asset. So different factors that affect the vulnerability of, a, of, a, of an asset is physical, social, economic, and environmental factors. And all of these increase the susceptibility of an individual or a community to the impact of hazard. So the extent of impact of, uh, of a hazard on an individual or a community depends, uh, is decided by different factors, such as physical factors, social factors, economic factors, and environmental factors. And these constitute the vulnerability of that individual or a community. So uh, if you take the case of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS is the hazard. That is that the virus has a potential to cause damage. So that is a hazard. And the pandemic, uh, uh, the pandemic affects different people differently. Uh, in the case of COVID, you can see that uh, elderly and children are more vulnerable to uh, the pandemic. So that is what is meant by vulnerability. Uh, next comes coping capacity. Coping capacity is the ability of people, organization, systems, using available skills and resources to manage adverse conditions. Uh, so the coping capacity basically means what is the capacity of an individual or the community uh, to overcome, overcome a difficult situation. It can, be, it can be a disaster, it can be anything. So how uh, all the all the uh, all the assets or all the uh, information or the knowledge that an individual has or the community has can help them overcome the situation easily, and this is called the coping capacity. So the coping capacity of a community or an or an individual can be increased by awareness, proper education, etc. In the picture, you can see. Uh, that a rock is falling down a slope. So here the rock is the hazard and you can see a person standing there. So the person is being exposed to a hazard. But if you have, in, in the first picture, you can see that there is a, there's a plank there which will prevent the rock from reaching the person. So preventive measures can increase your capacity. And the second picture, you can see that there are hurdles along the slope, which will in reduce the impact of the rock falling down the slope. So that those are called mitigation measures. And then there are individual level capacities, like if the person is strong enough, or if you can, uh, if you know how to escape from that situation, uh, if you know first aid, first aid skills or basic life support skills, all those things increase the capacity of an individual and help him or her overcome the adverse situation. So all these things constitute the coping capacity of the system. And now that we have discussed hazard, exposure, and vulnerability, we're going to discuss another term called risk. The risk is dependent on four factors. Earlier when I asked about hazard, someone had answered that hazard is a danger or risk. In disaster management terminology, risk means something else. Risk is the uh, risk depends upon hazard, exposure, vulnerability, and coping capacity, and it can be summarized into a single formula written here. Disaster risk is equal to hazard into exposure into vulnerability by coping capacity. So, uh, if you look at this this equation, you can see that disaster risk increases when hazard, exposure, or vulnerability increases and disaster risk decreases when the coping capacity increases. So if you better equip yourself or better equip the community to face disasters, that is your capacity increases and thereby you can minimize the risk. Now, having discussed all these terms, uh, I'd like to uh, hear from you, what do you mean by disaster? Can someone share? Uh, their ideas about about what they mean by disaster. Uh, 
can you all hear me? Uh, Ma'am, uh, a disaster can be uh, is a phenomenon which which can be natural as well as man-made. Okay, uh, but what kind of phenomenon? It can be natural as well as uh, uh, man-made. So that's the two types. Uh, but earlier we discussed about the different types of hazards, and there we said that there are two types of hazards. Natural and man-made. So, how is a hazard different from a disaster? A hazard, a disaster, maybe a maybe a, a larger version, and hazard is a smaller version. I don't know. Is the okay. reason for the disaster? Like that. Yes, yes, yes. That, that's what we're coming to. So, a disaster is a catastrophe, mishap, calamity, or grave occurrence in any area arising from natural or man-made causes or by accident or negligence, which results in substantial loss of life or human suffering or damage or destruction to property, environment, of, and, uh, and the magnitude is such that it is beyond the coping capacity of the community of the affected area. So hazard is anything that can cause damage, but all, uh, but all hazards need not turn into disaster. Disaster ha happens when the hazard goes to a such, such an extent that it, it, the impact is beyond the coping capacity of the community. If the, co uh, the community can uh, uh, bounce back from a particular hazard without any external help, it need not be called a disaster. For example, consider an earthquake that has happened uh, in a very remote place, say uh, in a desert or something. There, is, uh, there are no people living there, there are no buildings there. Uh, it's 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 an empty area, and if a small earthquake happens there, we do not call it a disaster because uh, nobody is affected, and uh, even the environment is not affected. So, so uh, the uh, since there is no damage on the people or the environment or or to the assets of the people, we do not call it a disaster. Disaster happens when the hazard impact the community in such a way that the community needs a lot of time and help, external help to recover from it. So that is the difference between hazard and disaster. So now that we see that uh, hazards lead to disasters, right? And hazards can be, uh, hazards can be natural or man-made. So we do not call, uh, there are no natural disasters, there are only natural hazards. So that is an important point to be kept in mind. Uh, disasters are caused by, if you look at this this uh, this relationship, you will see that uh, a risk increases when hazard exposure or vulnerability increases, and it decreases when capacity uh, capacity increases. Which means that even if a hazard happens, if you can increase the capacity, you will reduce the risk that is. Uh, that the community is facing. So you can always uh, uh, always stop a hazard from becoming a disaster by reducing the exposure, reducing the vulnerability, and by increasing the capacity. Now we'll see what disaster management is because we have decided all these terminologies, hazards, exposure, vulnerability, disaster, and capacity. Now we'll see what disaster management is. Disaster management, as per the Disaster Management Act 2005, says that it is a continuous and integrated process of planning, organizing, coordinating, and implementing measures which are necessary for preventing any danger or threat or any disaster. Prevention means that you're going to stop something from happening. The next is mitigation. Mitigation means you're reducing the risk uh, or uh, or its severity or consequences. And the third thing is capacity building, which includes research and knowledge management and preparedness to deal with any disaster, prompt response to any threatening disaster situation or disaster, assessing the severity or magnitude of effects of any disaster, evacuation, rescue and relief, rehabilitation and reconstruction. 
So you see that disaster management is an all-encompassing process. It, it's, it, it, there are different phases to it. Uh, so it involves the planning and coordination and implementation to ensure that a disaster, uh, if, if possible, it should be prevented. If not, it should be mitigated. And in order uh, to help the society overcome the adverse effects, it, we should build the capacities and increase the preparedness of the, uh, of the community. And if a disaster happens, then there should be prompt response to save the people and properties. And uh, people should uh, have, will have to be evacuated from the site. They'll have to be rescued, and they'll have to be kept. Uh, they'll have to be directed to relief camps where they can stay for some time until the situation comes uh, back to normal. And then they, uh, these people will have to be rehabilitated and their houses and all the buildings, transportation networks, uh, power networks, everything that was affected during the disaster will have to be reconstructed. So all of these activities, uh, the, the management of all of these activities constitutes disaster management as per the Disaster Management Act 2005. Uh, going to the second section, so, uh, it is uh, evolution of disaster management in India. Uh, so the timeline goes like this. Until 2001, the responsibility of disaster management was uh, was upon the agriculture ministry. You can see that if a, if a flood happens or drought happens, uh, people were compensated later. And this was uh, done through agriculture, and, uh, agriculture ministry. In June 2002, the responsibility was transferred to the Ministry of Home Affairs. And in September 2005, the National Disaster Management Authority was established as the apex body, which deals with the uh, disaster management of the whole country. And in December 2005, the Disaster Management Act was passed. And in 2009, National Disaster Management Policy was framed. Uh, uh, there, was a, there was a prominent paradigm shift that happened after the National Disaster Management uh, Policy uh, was, and the NDMA was established. It was earlier, it, the, the norm was to respond after a disaster happens. Like if a flood happens, the, uh, uh, the response happens after that. And it is usually uh, based, it, is, it usually focused on providing the affected people relief. So instead of that, it should it should be a proactive proactive prevention, mitigation, and preparedness driven approach. So we sh it should not the disaster management should not be just about providing relief to people after a disaster happens. It should be about how how a disaster can be prevented or how its severity can be reduced and how the community can prepare better so that uh, the development gains are conserved and the loss of life livelihood and properties minimized. Coming to the Disaster Management Act 2005, uh, this act is the 53rd Act of 2005. It was approved by the President on 23rd December 2005, and it was published in the guest on 26th December 2005. The Act constitutes 11 chapters in 79 sections. So why do we have an act like this? It is to basically establish an institutional mechanism to uh, fa uh, to deal tackle disasters. Uh, it is also to ensure that different departments of the government and its agencies work together during a disaster to ensure coordination between the different departments. Uh, and it also ensures that a holistic, coordinated, and prompt response is, uh, is uh, possible after any disaster. Uh, it also provides for the constitution of fund for managing disasters because we cannot uh, we cannot manage disasters without adequate funds. So the act act uh, lays in place all these provisions for funds also, and it further defines specific roles for local self government institutions. That is the panchayati raj institutions and urban local bodies. So the uh, DM Act, the Disaster Management Act, establishes a very clear premise wherein it, it lays down the different institutional mechanism, the roles of different, uh, different institutions in the government departments, and how disaster management can be done in a holistic, coordinated manner at different levels of the governing system. 
going ahead, uh, as I said earlier, the Act has 11 sections. Uh, the chapter one is a preliminary section, which talks about the short title of the Act and everything. And the second chapter is about the National Disaster Management Authority. The NDMA uh, is responsible for preparing and approving the National Disaster Management Plan and, and for implementing the same. Uh, chapter three talks about uh, uh, state disaster management authorities, how each, each state and uh, unit territory should have a separate authority for managing disaster called the state disaster management authority. And further, at the district level, there should be district disaster management authorities. That is what is mentioned in chapter four. And chapter five talks about what are the different measures government uh, should be taking for disaster management. And chapter six deals with uh, the roles and responsibilities of local authorities, how they should comply with the instructions of the district disaster management authority during a disaster. And chapter seven, it talks about National Institute of Disaster Management. This is a, uh, this is a research and capacity building institution, uh, which is established at the central, uh, at the national level. And uh, in chapter eight, it talks about National Disaster Response Force, which is uh, which is responsible for uh, responding to uh, responding immediately to disasters uh, happening anywhere in the country. Uh, chapter nine is about the finance or accounts and audit. Chapter ten talks about offenses and penalties. Like uh, for example, in, in uh, if a disaster happens and uh, if the instructions of the state government or the central government or the district disaster management authority is not being followed by a particular person or an institution, then according to this act, you can take legal action against them. It can be it can be a fine. It can be a, uh, it can go up to two years of imprisonment. There are different uh, different offenses and different penalties according to this. Like for example, spreading false information, uh, creating false alarm. All of these things can be considered as offenses uh, under this act during a disaster situation. And chapter 11 is about miscellaneous things. Uh, the act makes sure that nobody will be discriminated on the basis of their sex, caste, uh, descent, etc. So these are the different sections of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, now coming to the institutional mechanism of DN, uh, we have uh, mainly we have institutional mechanism at three levels. There is a central level state level and district level. We also have uh, uh, institutional setups below the district level, but that we'll discuss later. Uh, let's see what happens at the central level. So as discussed earlier, uh, um, initially the responsibility of disaster management was with the agricultural ministry, but later it was transferred to the uh, uh, home ministry. So at the central level, you have a national disaster management authority. It is the apex body with the prime minister as chairperson. Then you have a national executive committee. It is chaired by the cabinet secretary. Uh, then there are central, ministry, uh, central ministries, which are nodal uh, departments, and they have nodal offices there. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there is a National Institute of Disaster Management, NIDM, which is the research and capacity, build, uh, capacity building uh, wing. Uh, then to respond to disasters, we have National Disaster Response Force. So these are the different uh, institutions at the national level. Coming to the state level, there is a state disaster management authority, which is headed by the chief minister of the state. Then there is state executive committee uh, chaired by chief secretary of the state. Then there is state emergency operation center, uh, which is a 24, 7, 24 by seven functioning office. And it coordinates with the district disaster management authorities and the national disaster management authority. And uh, the uh, state emergency operation center is the most crucial uh, body when it comes to uh, disaster management at the state level. And then there is state disaster response force under the home department. Coming to the next level, that is the district level, the, the Disaster Management Act uh, stipulates that there should be district disaster management authorities for every district, uh, wherein the district collector or magistrate will be the chairperson and the district panchayat president will be the co-chairperson. 
Uh, along with the District Disaster Management Authority, there is also a District Emergency Operations Center. So in short, you have uh, National Disaster Management Authority at the center, State Disaster Management Authority is at state level, and District Disaster Management Authority is at the district level. And at the state level, you have State Emergency Operations Center, and in district levels, you have District Emergency Operations Center. Uh, further uh, going down, you, at the taluk level, you have control rooms. And further at the local self-government institution level, that is the uh, urban local bodies and panchayati raj institution, uh, we have LSCI steering committee and emergency response teams. So this is a rough outline about the institutional mechanism of disaster management. So at the national level, this is how it works. The overall coordination is done by the Ministry of Home Affairs and uh, the, uh, uh, under that, under the Ministry of Home Affairs comes National Disaster Management Authority and designated nodal ministries, disaster specific. Uh, the Cabinet Committee on Security and the National Crisis Management Com uh, Committee constitute the top level decision making bodies. And these are linked to, again, linked to uh, National Disaster Management Authority. You also have the National Executive Committee, which is uh, constituted by bureaucrats. And under the National Disaster Management Authority, you have National Institute of Disaster Management and National Disaster Response Force. Uh, below the National Disaster uh, Management Authority further communicates with the state level disaster management authorities. So at the state level, what happens is uh, we have central government ministries and departments uh, guiding the state government and also uh, the National Disaster Management Authority supporting the state government and the state disaster management authorities. So here in Kerala, the state disaster management authority is called Kerala State Disaster Management Authority, it is KSDMA. And we also have a state executive committee uh, of which uh, chief secretary is the CEO. And we have different crisis management group and the state disaster response force also. Uh, under the state executive committee, we have a state relief commissioner who is the principal secretary or the additional chief secretary of Department of Revenue and Disaster Management. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, the disaster management comes under the Department of Home Affairs at the central level, whereas at the state level, whereas in Kerala, uh, we have uh, a separate department for Department of Revenue and Disaster Management under which KSMA is there. So after the State Relief Commissioner, we have a Commissioner for Disaster Management uh, that is also an IAS officer. And uh, the State Emergency Operations uh, Center functions under him. Uh, and all the nodal departments are also connected to the com uh, Commissioner Rate of Disaster Management. Further under the KSDMA, we have uh, District Disaster Management Authorities at the district level and District Emergency Operations Centers. So the disaster man uh, coming specifically to disaster management in Kerala, uh, I'll take you through a few major milestones that has happened in, in the disaster management sector. So KSDMA was constituted in 2007 and the Kerala State Disaster Management rules were promulgated. Uh, in 2008, district disaster management authorities were established in all 14 districts of the state. In 2009, Eight districts in the state have uh, uh, had uh, deputy collectors for disaster management. Uh, in 2010, state disaster management policy was formulated. And again in 2010, the state disaster management plan profile was also published. In 2012, state emergency operation center was made functional. Uh, again in 2012, a five-year plan budget head was created for KSDMA and also state disaster mitigation fund was created. There are two types of funds, state disaster response fund and state disaster mitigation fund. Uh, and in 2013, uh, 100 men strong disaster response force was created. In 2015, district disaster management plans of all 14 districts were published. In 2016, state disaster management plan was published. And in 2020, uh, Orange Book of Disaster Management, which is basically a 
uh, basically an SOP for on how uh, different departments and different agencies should function during a disaster is, was published. These are some of the uh, most important milestones that happened in the disaster management sector of Kerala. Coming to the hazard profile of the state, uh, given here is a multi-hazard zonation map of the state. You can see that uh, you'd be familiar with the uh, profile of the state. That is, we have a long coastline on the uh, western part of the state. And on the eastern parts, you have a very hilly mountain terrain, uh, which is called the Western Ghats. Uh, so uh, automatically, uh, the profile becomes such that you have raised uh, elevated areas on, uh, in the eastern side of the, si uh, of the state. And then you have uh, midlands in the middle and lowlands towards the coastal belt. So uh, because of this, this uh, profile of the state, uh, it is prone to multiple hazards. It, it is prone to uh, floods, it is prone to landslide, it's prone to uh, coastal hazards. Uh, and as for earthquake, the state falls in zone three. Uh, uh, and also another thing to be noted here is that Kerala is highly, uh, it's very densely po populated. It's a small strip of land with, uh, with, uh, with high density population. It is the third most densely populated state in the country. Uh, so the impact of disasters are going to be very high because of this or because of this dense population. 14.5% uh, percentage of the state is flood prone. In the map, you can see yellow colored uh, areas, which are flood prone areas. You can see that uh, the western part of the state is more prone to flooding uh, since it's, it's a low land. Uh, and eastern part of the state, that is the western guts, that area is more prone to landslide. 14.4 percent of the area is prone to landslides. And since we have a long, long uh, co uh, coastline, uh, 55 percent of this co uh, this coastline is prone to coastal hazards, such as it can be cyclones, it can be storm surge, it can be uh, wave action, uh, etc. So, uh, and we also have lightning incidences every year. Uh, we are uh, like uh, we also have communicable disease, and we lose several people to communicable disease every year. Uh, we also have anthropogenic or human-induced hazards such as vehicle accidents, transport accidents, etc. So the state disaster management plan identifies the following state-specific hazards. They these are again grouped into natural hazards and. Uh, anthropogenic hazards. So we have identified 70 natural hazards. This includes flood, landslides, drought, uh, coastal hazards, wind, lightning, earthquake, human epidemics, uh, different kinds of epidemics, uh, soil piping. You must have heard about soil piping after 2018. Uh, you must have seen photos of soil piping in, in newspapers and all. Uh, heat wave, etc. So uh, there are 17 natural hazards identified as state as specific hazards in the state disaster management plan. Uh, and we have 22 anthropogenic hazards. This includes stampedes, accidents, petrochemical accidents, dam breaks, fire accidents, boat capsizing, terrorism activities, next light attacks, uh, and different biological accidents, nuclear accidents, armed forces uh, premises accidents happening there. So uh, we have a total of 39 hazards identified in the state disaster management plan, 17 of which are natural hazards and 22 of which are anthropogenic hazards. Uh, coming to Kerala State Disaster Management Authority, as, as mentioned earlier, it was formed in 2007. Uh, the members of SDMA are Honorable Chief Minister, who is the chairperson of SDMA, Honorable Minister for Revenue, who is the vice chairperson, Honorable Minister for Agriculture, who is a member, Chief Secretary of the State is the CEO of the SDMA. And then you also have uh, additional Chief Secretary Home Home uh, Ministry as, a, as another member and Principal Secretary Revenue as a convener. And we have Head Scientist of the State Emergency Operations Center as a member secretary of SDMA. So SDMA takes all the policy decisions regarding disaster management in the state, and SDMA meets every, every year. Uh, so after SDMA, we have 
State Executive Committee, SEC. The members of SEC are Chief Secretary, who is the CEO, Additional Chief Secretary Finance, Additional Chief Secretary Home, Additional Chief Secretary Revenue and Disaster Management, who is also the convener of State Executive Committee. We have Principal Secretary Health as a, as a member. So SEC takes all routine administrative decisions and it meets every three months. Then we have Kerala State Emergency Operations Center, which is a 24 by seven functioning office. Uh, it conducts and regular, regularly updates the hazard, vulnerability, and risk assessment of the state. It is also responsible for preparing the state disaster management plan and district disaster management plans. Uh, the conceptualization and implement, implementation of the hazard early warning system is also, uh, is also uh, interested upon the Kerala State Emergency Operations Center. Uh, it, it creates and maintains disaster da database of the state uh, it also undertakes research projects which are relevant to disaster risk reduction. And during disaster scenarios, it, the, it is the Kerala State Emergency Operations Center that coordinates between the national bodies, the national forces, and the district disaster management authorities and the state forces. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it also prepares calamity memoranda. Calamity memoranda is something that you submit. It, it is a report that you submit after a disaster happens to the central ministry for seeking funds. So after every disaster, the it is the uh, KCOC that prepares the calamity memoranda, which will record the different types of damages that happened in different sectors. It could be uh, human life loss. It could be loss that happened in livelihoods. It could be loss in the uh, roads and bridges, uh, power network. All these sectors are assessed separately and the damages and losses are calculated and it is submitted as a report to the central ministry for seeking funds. Uh, and then we also foster research collaboration with external agencies. So these are the different functions of K uh, Kerala State Emergency Operations Centre. Uh, on a daily basis, we, uh, the Kerala State Emergency Operations Center gives updates about different things like what are the water levels in different dams of the state, what are the water levels in different uh, uh, different rivers of the state, uh, what is the five-day rainfall forecast. You must have seen all these in, uh, we publish this in the uh, SDMA website as well as in all social media pages like uh, Twitter and uh, Facebook. So you must have seen all these maps with uh, red, orange, yellow alerts. All, all of these are being, uh, all these maps are prepared by the KCOC on the basis of the warnings received from India Meteorological Department, that is IMB. Uh, we also issue fishermen warning whether fishermen, whether it's safe for fishermen to venture out into the sea, whether there are any threats like cyclones or heavy rains or wind, whether it's safe for them. So fishermen warnings are in, uh, issued every day at 1 p.m. We also have short for forecast that is called nowcast, and we also have uh, several other uh, warnings, lightning warnings, heavy wind warnings, thunder warnings, temperature forecasts such as heat wave, sunburn or sunstroke during summers. Uh, we also have cyclone systems update, which we received from IMD, and then we interpret, it, uh, interpret the level of uh, the uh, impact that it can uh, happen, cause in Kerala. We also publish guidelines to uh, uh, warnings to the public as well as guidelines to concerned officials. Uh, coming to the structure of KSDMA, uh, this is the organogram. Uh, you can see that the, under the KSDMA, we have State Executive Committee and State Relief Commissioner, that is SRC. And under the State Relief Commissioner, we have Commissioner for Disaster Management, that is CMD. And under the CMD, we have Member Secretary of KSMA, who is also the head scientist of State Emergency Operations Center. So we have two different, two major sections, that is the KCOC and the Office of SDMA. Office of SDMA deals with the uh, administrative uh, aspects uh, of uh, of the STMA, whereas the Emergency Operations Center deals with the da daily updates as well as uh, long-term uh, research and uh, uh, emergency coordination. So uh, on the KCOC is further divided into uh, five sections, the most important of which is the Fusion Center. 
the fusion center uh, is headed by the hazard and risk analyst who reports to the member secretary or the head of the coc and under the uh, hazard and risk analyst you have uh, hazard analyst for, uh, the these are basically multidisciplinary it's, it's a multidisciplinary team you have hazard analyst for environment hazard analyst for forest hazard analyst for meteorology hazard analyst for oceanography you have hazard analyst for civil engineering uh, and uh, we also have meteorologists we have a team of three meteorologists and we also have a hydrologist uh, under the fusion center then there is another wing called the planning section uh, it is led by the environment planner and there are different officials under the environment planner like the safety engineer agriculture specialist urban planner rural development specialist and architect so i come under the planning section of the kcuc uh, we also have a capacity building and project section which is headed by the state project officer uh, and uh, the social capacity building specialist supports this state project officer uh, and in the dis and, and we also have a risk lab this lab basically produces all the maps that are issued for daily warnings and as well as for the state disaster management plans the district disaster management plans and even the local self government level disaster management plans uh, and in the districts as uh, as mentioned earlier we have the district disaster management authorities and every district disaster management authority and district emergency operation center has a hazard analyst who work at the district level and we also have a uh, lsg dm plan coordinators so it's it's quite an elaborate uh, setup uh, which takes care of uh, different activities at different levels that is the state level district level and the local self government level so uh, when uh, when you uh, whenever you get a warning from a competent agency or whenever you see a disaster report from the media or public or if you receive the information from the district emergency operation center it, it the the information is received at the state emergency operation center and it further uh, is uh, the information is uh, uh, further transferred to lower levels such as the district incident commander district emergency operation centers taluk control rooms and village offices that is how the information passes from the state level to the local level and uh, you all, uh, the district uh, medical officer district police uh, chief district fire and rescue officer the police stations and the fire and rescue stations are also alerted uh, during a disaster if need be central forces are also uh, uh, requested to come down to the state and uh, help with the response uh, like uh, it could be evacuation rescue and relief activities so depending upon the severity of the disaster it is the state incident commander who decides whether we need uh, we need national level support like whether we sh we should call national disaster response force or whether it can be managed within the state those those decisions are taken by the state incident commander uh, with support from inputs from the coc so this is how information is passed from the state level to the community level Uh, coming to the state disaster management plan it was published in 2016 it con uh, consists of 10 chapters the state disaster management plan basically identifies what are the vulnerabilities of kerala what are the hazards that kerala is prone to and then it looks into different di different aspects like preparedness mitigation uh, mainstreaming of disaster management uh, because disaster management cannot be handled on by only by a department it has to be a holistic coordinated approach wherein different departments of the government work together to manage the disaster so the responsibilities of different stakeholders are laid out in the disaster management plan it also talks about disaster response and relief how it should be carried out and how rehabilitation and reconstruction activities should be carried out it also uh, talks about the different financial arrangements like that is the state disaster response fund and state disaster mitigation fund uh, so these are the uh, these are the um, different components of the state disaster management plan which is published in 2016 and it is now being updated
Apart from the state disaster management plan, we also have a set of guidelines which are published in the KSDMA website. You can if you can access all these guidelines from through this link. So some of the important guidelines are Kerala State uh, Lightning Action Plan, Kerala State Heat Action Plan. Then there is this Orange Book of Disaster Management, which is basically a standard operating procedure for monsoon preparedness and response. So this, this orange book is a very crucial document, which uh, talks about what each department should do when a disaster strikes and what, what are the actions that are to be taken during different, uh, different alerts. So all these things are uh, written in detail in the orange book and it is updated every year. So for example, it was published in 2020 for the first time. Uh, and then again, when, when COVID struck, we updated the orange book to include the aspects of COVID. Like, for example, what are the what are the uh, things that need to be taken care of in camps when when you have monsoon as well as the COVID happening at the same time? So all these things are written in detail in the orange book. You can uh, it is available for download at the at the SDMA website. You have hospital safety guidelines, especially the rapid safety audit of COVID-19 hospitals across the state. We have heard about different incidents happening in different states of the country where uh, like fire accidents happened in COVID uh, hospitals, oxygen shortage happening, uh, all these leading to the death of several COVID patients. So uh, in order to prevent such mishaps, uh, KSDMA conducted a hospital safety, rapid safety audit in all COVID hospitals in the state. Uh, we also prepared a compendium of safety protocols for containment of oxygen leakages in, in, in hospitals. Uh, we have a separate minimum standard, uh, minimum standards for relief. It's a, set, a separate code for what is the minimum amount to be given in different cases. Like for example, uh, uh, like for example, if a, if a house is completely damaged, you give four lakhs of rupees. Uh, so if a, a house is 10 percent damaged, how much amount is to be given? What is the amount of amount to be given for a partially damaged house, partially fully damaged house uh, for maintaining the roads and bridges? So for the reconstruction of all the assets, what are the minimum standards to be followed? That is being discussed in the Kerala state minimum standards of duty. Uh, we also have handbooks on school safety. Uh, since uh, uh, since you are all civil engineers, you should be you should you can benefit from uh, there. There are handbooks such as handbooks on uh, safe construction practices, focusing on floods and landslide, which was published in 2019. And we also have a safe construction practice handbook on earthquake. Uh, another important handbook is the disability and disaster risk, risk reduction. So these are the different guidelines that are published by KSDMA. Everything is accessible on KSDMA website. Uh, now coming to different projects, apart from the routine activities, we also have projects such as National Cyclone Risk Mitigation Project. It, it involves the construction of cyclone, risk, cyclone shelters across the state uh, so that people can take refuge in these centers during uh, whenever there is a cyclone warning. Uh, so these are multi-purpose uh, shelters which can be used for an, uh, other purposes during normal times and it will act as a rescue shelter during uh, cyclone warnings. Uh, another important project is Disability Inclusive Disaster Risk Reduction. It is a pioneering project in India itself. Uh, this was the first time that a state was coming up with guidelines for uh, guidelines for including differently able people in the process of disaster risk reduction and how they should be uh, given special attention during disasters. We also have these guidelines published in Braille. Mm, apart from that, we have projects by UN agencies such as UNDP, UNICEF, and also to coordinate the different activities of non-governmental non organizations and civil society organizations. We, we have a project office of Sphere India as well. Uh, so we have so far we have discussed how disaster management happens at the national level, state level. Now coming to the disaster management at the district level, as mentioned earlier, we have district disaster management authorities. These were constituted in 2008. Uh, uh, DDMAs are supposed to meet every three months, and the minutes of the meeting are to be sent to the state emergency operations center and the, the disaster management department of the government. 
uh, members of DDMA include the district collector, who is the chairperson, district panchayat president, who is the co-chairperson, additional district magistrate or deputy collector of disaster management, who is a CEO, superintendent of police, district medical officer, uh, district officer or assistant district officer of fire and rescue. All these three are members of the DDMA. We also have uh, EE of major irrigation, PWD roads, RDO, principal agriculture office in DD of fisheries. Uh, so in eight districts, that is Tiruvanduvaram, uh, Patanam Ditta, Alapura, Ernagulam, Trishur, Malapuram, Kolkod and Kannur, the CEO of DDMA is the Deputy Collector, Disaster Management, whereas in the districts such as Kollam, Kotem, Idiki, Palakkad, Vayanad, and Kasagod, the CE of DDMA is Additional District Magistrate or uh, Deputy Collector General. So DEOCs attached to the DDMAs are 24 by 7 functioning offices, where, which has staff of revenue, police, and fire and rescue services. Uh, DDMAs uh, prepare the district disaster management plans. Uh, all 14 districts of the state have district disaster management plans, which were approved by the KSDMA in 2015. Uh, you can access these plans from this link. Uh, these plans are also now being updated. Uh, further, uh, at a lower level, uh, that is below the district level, you have talu control rooms. We have 75 taluks in the state. Uh, and this, these talu control rooms are operationalized during monsoon season and are based uh, or, or whenever there is a need as, uh, as uh, ascertained by DOC or SEOC to function the taluk office. Further, we have village offices also playing a role in the disaster management at the, uh, at the local level. Uh, so we have discussed how disaster management happens at the state level and district level. Now coming to the uh, community level, that is the local self-government level, uh, we have prepared disaster management plans. So why should we have disaster management plans at the community level? Because uh, whenever any disaster happens, it is the community members, it is your neighbors who are going to rush to the site and uh, help the people who are affected. So community is always the first responder during disasters. Uh, it is the community who know uh, it is the uh, who knows the place and the resources of the place the best. Uh, 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 even if the police or the fire and rescue officers or even the NDR, National Disaster Response Force, even if all of them come to the disaster site, it is the community who is who has the best knowledge about the uh, about that particular place. Uh, so it's essential that these local level plans are formed so that the response, relief and rehabilitation activities are streamlined and people need to be aware of the hazard susceptibility and resources of their place. So a documentation of all these things in, a, in, a, in one place, like in the form of a disaster management plan, will help the community and the authorities res uh, in, to respond to disasters in a better streamlined manner. So why did we decide to uh, prepare disaster management plans at the LSG level in Kerala is that uh, after the floods and landslides of August 2018, uh, a post-disaster needs assessment was conducted in October 2018. This, was, this exercise was done by Kerala uh, government uh, and it was led by UN agencies, especially UNDP. So all these UN agencies like UNDP, UNESCO, UNICEF, uh, WHO, World Food Programme, all these agencies came together and did a very comprehensive sectoral post-disaster needs assessment, wherein it was assessed, uh, wherein all the damages and losses uh, happened during the 2018 floods and landslide was assessed and the uh, um, uh, amount of money requ required to reconstruct this was also calculated and this report was published. You can access it from this link. Uh, and uh, as a response to the post-disaster needs assessment report, Rebuild Kerala initiative was formed in November 2018 as a special purpose vehicle to, uh, to uh, focus on the reconstruction activities of the state. And the RKI further came up with a report called Rebuild Kerala Development Program in May 2019. 
So both these reports, the PDNA report as well as the RKDP report suggest that uh, disaster management plans should not only be prepared at the state level and the district level, but also at the local self-government level. So that is why the government took a decision to prepare local self-government level disaster management plans across the state. This is the uh, this is also a major uh, landmark in the disaster management sector of Kerala because such a uh, state pan state level exercise has not been done in any other states uh, of the country. Uh, in Kerala, almost all the local self-government institutions have prepared their uh, disaster management plans. So uh, out of the 1,034 disaster management, uh, 1,034 LSGIs, which has 941 panchayats, 87 municipalities and six corporations, we have received 938 panchayat DM plans, 86 municipality DM plans and six corporation DM plans. So we have a total of uh, 1,030 disaster management plans available. Uh, these plans were, uh, these plans also have been reviewed at the district level as by the LSG DM plan coordinators who were specially recruited for the review of these plans and also at the state level by, uh, by five sectoral experts. Uh, so the, the major part of uh, the, uh, the LSD DM plans is the identification of different hazards to which the uh, LSGI is prone to. Uh, and it, it documents the disaster history of the local body. Uh, it further uh, documents the different capacities of the LSGI. It, it has, it forms, uh, it do, uh, documents the formation of LSD steering committee, which is, uh, which is constituted by the panchayat president, uh, if it's a panchayat, municipal chairperson, if it's a municipality, and the mayor, if it's a corporation. Uh, it also, the members also include standing committee chairpersons, LSD secretary, and invited members. So this committee, this LSD steering committee is responsible for coordinating all activities during disaster situations in a, in a local self-government institution. Uh, this uh, LSG steering committee is also responsible for preparing the LSG DM plan. You also have emergency response teams uh, formed as stipulated by the LSG DM plans. There are four different teams, such as early warning dissemination team, search, rescue, and evacuation team, shelter management team, first aid or basic life support team. So all these different teams are formed by people of the community so that the people of the community are well equipped in disaster management and since they are in the best position to help each other, so they are given training in their respective sector by uh, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority and the Kerala Institute of Local Administration. It's a joint effort. So the emergency uh, response teams, these four, uh, every LSGI will have these four response teams and they'll be enlisted in the uh, LSDDM plan document and they'll be trained regularly. So what was the role of KSDMA in preparing LSDDM plans? So LSDDM uh, plan template was prepared initially by the uh, KSDMA and the template was then handed over to Kila who then further uh, refined it and then gave it to the uh, local self government institutions for the preparation of the plan. And the local resource persons of the LSDs were trained on how to prepare the DM plans by uh, KSDMA and KILA. Uh, after the preparation of uh, uh, preparation of the DM plan template, KSDMA also prepared uh, LSDI level maps for uh, for hazard susceptibility and basic infrastructure. So each LSGI was given 31 numbers of maps each uh, showing uh, the different types of hazards the uh, LSGI is prone to, the different facilities in the LSGI, et cetera. Uh, further, after the preparation of uh, LSG DM plans, uh, KSD may also review these DM plans and organized capacity building programs both for the uh, this is a, actually a multi-tiered activity. The capacity building programs are organized for people's representatives, 
community members and the uh, uh, officials, LSGA officials. So we have uh, kind of covered most part of the presentation. So we have discussed the institutional mechanism at the state level, district level, uh, local self-government level. We have a few more mechanisms uh, at, uh, that we'll be seeing. Uh, so Abda Mitra. Abda Mitra is a national scheme for training of community volunteers in disaster response. So the word Abda Mitra literally means friends during disasters. So the aim of this national scheme is to uh, create a team of volunteers who will be helping the community in case a disaster happens. So from Kerala, Kotem district was selected for this project. And the stakeholders of this project are KSDMA, Kerala State Fire and Rescue Department, and DDMA Kotem. So in Kotem, uh, under this scheme, 200 volunteers have been trained. Uh, apart from the initial training, they are also given refresher training every year. And the volunteers are also provided with individual emergency responders kit, which they can use during emergencies to help others. So they are uh, trained in different, uh, different skills, such as first aid, basic life support, emergency, evacuation, etc. Uh, the second uh, setup is Samuhiga Sanada Sena. You must have heard about this uh, recently. Uh, the, uh, and the tremendous effort of volunteers du during and after the 2018 floods was well recognized by the uh, government. So the government decided to create a common platform for all volunteers and voluntary organizations in the state so that these volunteers and organizations can work along with the government uh, government agencies and systems. So the government uh, created Samohiga Sanada Sena and, and a separate directorate has been established solely for this. Uh, the website of the Samohiga Sanada Sena is given here. Everybody can go and enroll in this website and enroll as a volunteer. Uh, and these uh, Samohiga Sanada Sena is also trained under, uh, trained in different skills and these training modules were facilitated by KSDM. Then we have, uh, apart from the uh, um, apart from the government setup for disaster management or the community level volunteers setup, we we also have non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations who also play a very important role during disaster management. So as for the Disaster Management Act 2005, involvement of non-governmental organizations in disaster management is also deemed very essential and it's a mandatory requirement. So uh, Kerala has formed interagency groups, which, which is basically a common collaboration platform for non-governmental agencies functioning in the state. So if, if there is an NGO or a civil society organization, you can... Uh, register yourself with the interagency group so that you can work in tandem with the district authorities as, uh, as well as the state authorities. So all districts of Kerala uh, have notified interagency group, which has a registry of uh, registry of all these non-governmental organizations. And this inter these interagency group ensure there is a close engagement with non-governmental agencies and civil society organizations. So these are the different uh, legal and uh, institutional mechanism of disaster management in the state. Uh, if you have any questions, I, I'll try my best to answer those to the best of my abilities. I'm also quite a newbie to this sector. Uh, I was introduced to the disaster management sector after the 2018 floods and landslides when I worked with UNDP as the sheltered project uh, coordinator. Uh, right now, uh, I've been working with the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority as an architect. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll try my best to answer. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, participants can post the questions in the chat box. Uh, the topic might have been a bit dry for you all because it's it is basically talking about uh, the legal aspects and the institutional aspects. Uh, yeah, but if there are any questions.
Ma'am, can I have a doubt? Yes. Okay, ma'am. I think in 18 and 2018 and 19, uh, what happened in Kerala? I think so. Yes. Oh, my question is what are the disaster management techniques which are followed by our state? I mean, uh, any kind of disaster preventive techniques? Yes, uh, the preventive measures have to be taken before a disaster happens. So, in at KSDMA, you have all, all these kinds of activities happening simultaneously. So, there are different phases of disaster management. There is a preparedness phase, there is a mitigation phase, there is a rescue evacuation phase. So, all these, uh, KSDMA is involved in all these different phases. Uh, as for prevention, uh, uh, we have regular capacity building programs for, as mentioned earlier, for government officials, for community members, uh, and for people's representatives. So they are uh, they are trained in different skills, and we also undertake uh, different uh, research projects. We have uh, we have uh, internship programs also. So. Yeah, there are different kinds of preventive measures and mitigation measures. Uh, for example, Operation Ananta, uh, uh, which happened in Trivandrum, can be considered as a preventive or a mitigation measure. Uh, as for 2018 and 19 floods, it was quite unexpected because it was an extreme weather phenomenon. Uh, so uh, the preventive and uh, mitigation measures were going on as usual, like capacity building programs and uh, uh, whenever we have an alert, like red alert or orange alert, the orange book of disaster management has a very well laid out protocol. So the protocol is activated before uh, for each alert, and that is how we try to tackle each disaster. Okay, ma'am. You already mentioned about an orange book. Uh, yes, yes. The orange book is... Uh, I can post the link to the orange book here in the chat box. Orange book is basically a, uh, a SOP, uh, Standard Operating Operation Procedure. It talks about what different stakeholders and different, uh, I posted the link in the chat box. It talks about uh, the roles and responsibilities of different government departments according to the alerts issued by the uh, state disaster management authorities and district disaster management authorities. So uh, it it, uh, uh, it talks in uh, very detail uh, at length about what are the steps to be taken, what are, uh, what are um, who should be alerted, when should they be alerted, uh, things like that. If you go through the book, it will be much clearer for you. Okay, thank you. Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I I think okay. I, I can hear you. No, that was not a question. I thought that was a question oh. in the chat box. Okay, okay. So uh, what happens during any disaster is that we basically get the warnings from different nodal uh, uh, nodal agencies at the national level. For example, uh, for uh, just a second, I can show you another slide. So these are the central agencies which are designated for natural hazard specific early warnings. So for cyclones, we have India Meteorological Department. Uh, for earthquake, we have India Meteorological Department. For epidemics, it's Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. For floods, it's Central Water Commission. For heat wave, again, it's India Meteorological Department. For landslides, it is Geological Survey of India. So it is the duty of these organizations to give the give warnings to state disaster management authorities and it, it is the duty of state disaster management authorities to uh, activate the protocols and take necessary action so the sdmas uh, or the SEOCs basically has, uh, receive the warnings from different central agencies and interpret these warnings and see what 
this warning means to the state, how it's going to impact the states. Such kind of an assessment is carried out at the SEOC level. And then SEOC issues uh, necessary warnings and guidelines, do's and don'ts to the public as well as to different departments and agencies. So these are the different agencies from which we receive uh, warnings. For so coastal erosion, it's INCOIS. Fisherman warning is also received from INCOIS and uh, IMB. Strong winds, again, IMB. Heat wave is also IMB. Lightning is also IMB. So we receive warnings from these central agencies, assess them, uh, understand what this means to the state, understand what, what, what kind of impact it's going to uh, cause in the state, and then take necessary action. So SEOC basically coordinates between the national uh, disaster management authorities and the district level disaster management authorities. And uh, according to the protocol that is laid out in the orange book, we uh, inform uh, different departments, different officers, like we have a, we have a communication network for IAS officers, the state, for media, for uh, district collectors, so we have these different groups of lines of communication. Everybody, everybody is alerted and uh, the procedure is followed. Ma'am, uh, recently we heard about uh, the fisherman goat died for uh, in the sea. So how well uh, do you think this disaster management is working or functioning in Kerala? Uh, so we issue fisherman warning every day at 1 p.m. Uh, the thing is, uh, we receive the warning from, uh, like I said, we have different central agencies for different kinds of disasters, right? So we receive the warning from the central agencies, and then we decide whether fishermen, whether it's safe for fishermen to venture out in the sea. So uh, sometimes the warnings are issued, but uh, fishermen do not pay heed to them because uh, whenever there is rain or strong wind, we cannot take a chance, right? we have to issue a warning and say that it's not safe for fishermen to go to the sea because it will cost you life and property. Uh, so we issue uh, warnings every day. Uh, sometimes, so on some days, some days there will be no warning. It will be safe for them to go, go uh, venture out to the sea. But on some, day, some days, we'll specifically say that it is not safe to go out in the sea, especially in these, these coast areas. So... The warning systems are in place, uh, but uh, it is up to the public to take it seriously and follow it through. Okay. Uh, there is another question in the chat box. Are there any campaigns for raising awareness level of people in Kerala on disaster management? Definitely, definitely. We have uh, a lot of training programs happening for, like I said earlier, it, uh, it can... Uh, we have campaigns for school students. We have training programs for college-going students. We have internship programs. Uh, we also have uh, training programs for people's representatives. Uh, and uh, we, we had held exhibitions on resilient construction practices across the state after the 2018 floods. Uh, so we have uh, we regularly uh, produce uh, IEC materials, that is information and communication uh, materials on different types of hazards. Uh, recently, we also had a water safety campaign uh, wherein uh, every day we we uh, we had uh, uh, campaign mode activities about uh, safety uh, safety measures to be followed uh, when you're swimming and things like that. Uh, so, yeah, there are many campaigns. Details of all of these can be found in the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority website. Yeah. And we also uh, promote these through our Facebook and Twitter pages, handles. Okay. Any other questions from the participants? We also have uh, specific school safety programs and hospital safety programs. So we encourage all the schools and hospitals to have their own disaster management plans prepared so that any kind of, you know, the students and uh, students, teachers, and everybody around the school is also prepared to tackle any kind of a mishap happening. Okay. So 
So I think uh, we can wind up the question and answer session. So. Thanks a lot. Thank I, uh, I, it must have been a, a not so interesting session for you to sit through considering that it was a bit dry. Uh, the topic was like that. Uh, but hope you got some rough idea at least about the disaster management uh, sector in the state. And I'll be happy to have any questions uh, at any time later. You can email me at arcksdma at gmail.com. I'll put it in the chat box as well. In case you have any further queries, I'll be happy to uh, talk to my fellow colleagues and, and, and try to get answers for those questions. Thanks. And thank you once again, uh, Department of Civil Engineering and uh, Humaida Madam, who, with whom I have talked. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, I would like to invite Ms. Humaida, FDP coordinator, to deliver vote of thanks. Participants kindly fill up the feedback form. The link of the same is shared in the chat box. Thank you, Gayatri. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to our speaker, Ms. Jinku Yu, architect of Reaper Kerala Initiative Project, Kerala State Disaster Management Authority. Ma'am, I'm sure that your talk was really enlightening and informative for the listeners. We started the session with the uh, basic terminologies. Actually, those terms are very much familiar with us, but the exact meaning is conveyed today. Thank you for that. So you gave us an idea about the institutional mechanism of disaster management being uh, in central and both in central and state level. And actually, we are unaware of what, what is happening at the Disaster Management Authority, but you uh, give us an overview of what all departments are there and how they work and uh, how the information has uh, passed from the top level to the bottom level. All these uh, areas are very much created by your map. Thanks a lot for that. And once again, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining with us and sparing your valuable time and sharing your uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wish you all the best for the program. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, that's the end of today's program. Hope all the participants have filled the feedback form. Thank you again, uh, Indu, ma'am. Thank you all.